Okay, good morning to everyone. We're going to start uh, the second day of our uh, uh, summer event of uh, the uh, Bernard Maris Chair. After a very interesting uh, debate yesterday on uh, regional uh, uh, crisis and uh, crisis regions uh, confronted to multiple crises. We had to stop uh, the um, Jérôme uh, Vincente speech to today because uh, I think there is, uh, it's absolutely useless to introduce him. You all know him. He's a professor at Sciences Po Toulouse. He's been here with us for many years. He's the, uh, the DRDV director of research, uh, adding value uh, and, uh, to uh, doctorate, PhD uh, added value at university, as you know, uh, we University of Toulouse is integrating uh, the, all the universities, and his role is to uh, make sure that all the research uh, axes developed on the uh, Toulouse sites uh, are linked and intertwined and work together. So uh, Jérôme, we know him as a friend, but also for his research work on uh, local and regional development on clusters. His book on clusters uh, is a real reference on the subject and his work on the, the, uh, this topic and on the uh, uh, collaboration network uh, on uh, innovation. Uh, they have become a re reference work. Jérôme is going to uh, present us a, a research uh, program in progress on identification of uh, cap capabilities and uh, uh, skills of uh, technological skills of uh, the Occitanie region. I'm going to speak in French because we have a, a translation uh, translation work that is very efficient. Uh, thanks uh, for them. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we've had so far a very nice program. And uh, we are touching upon uh, difficult topics. And I know how difficult it is to uh, build a, a program so that it is uh, motivating people, academic, uh, academics, but also it's like a policy forum, really. I think it is the, uh, the context of my presentation is not really a research work. So uh, 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 over the past few months, I didn't have time to... Uh, do research. It's really a study. How do you detect the scientific profile of a region? We're very close to what Ron was presenting yesterday. Uh, it's more like a. Uh, it, it, my study uh, takes a different outlook and uh, it answers many queries and questions. There is a n double uh, answer. Uh, the need uh, there was to reinforce the project of uh, the whole of the Toulouse universities because there is an excellence initiative bid. That's how we call it. It is bid to actually gather and gain uh, millions of euros to sustain research in, uh, in, fr in France, in Toulouse, and we lost it five or six years ago. Other regions have these uh, subsidies. We want to show we have an international role to play, and it is supported by a, a real ID academic identity, scientific identity of uh, the Toulouse uh, site. It's not based at all on science. It is scientific too, not as scientific as Ron, but um, still scientific. Having said that, we, are f we have finalized the project and we have presented it. It is uh, finished. But uh, the roundtable we had yesterday on the uh, local uh, collectivity on, uh, uh, for supporting innovation and research, this study is really the uh, introduction to what we want to build with uh, the regional actors, policy makers at regional level to uh, see this uh, 
scientific outlook to uh, see it evolving so that we have support policy that will be more efficient. The region is, tries to uh, support uh, the uh, research excellence. I use research excellence really actually tries to find the right systems to uh, really have a, a bigger impact of, uh, uh, for uh, the uh, uh, scope of uh, scientific and so society excellence. We want to make sure that the, the scientific research we will carry on will attract uh, the uh, uh, really uh, regional act uh, att attractivity uh, so that uh, Ron will stay all his life in Toulouse, for example. Our colleague uh, who uh, has joined uh, him will be jealous and will want to grant the, and have the same subsidies to stay. I know Ron. For Ron, you need to demonstrate for, from this system to show that Ron will be the right person for him to find the right partnerships on site and for our researchers to also take advantage of Ron's experience. Uh, we want also to uh, have a, a transfer crossovers with industry. Uh, you spoke about it, uh, Ron, yesterday. Some uh, regions have industry and science uh, profiles and others do not match. So we need to have a, a really fine analysis of uh, the uh, scientific profile of the region. It is longitudinal. Uh, it is a very uh, preliminary observation phase to observe what is coming out. It's not easy to observe what is emerging in a region or even in a network which is non-regional. Uh, what is being uh, reinforced and what is declining? We are here as observers and also to have a positional analysis. Uh, where is the region we are studying compared to other regions? We can have an impact in one uh, topic and be very weak in others, and we can be weaker too in this uh, topic than the, our uh, next door region or compared to other European regions. So here I'm going to refer back to what Cesar uh, Cesar Hidalgo had yesterday about a prospective analysis. This, this is the uh, uh, scientific outlook. What will be the path that we'll need to take, the site should take, vis-a-vis uh, -vis this potential? Uh, local uh, regional powers uh, are very interested in, in this. So the whole debate could be uh, really uh, focused on this. The context today, what is, a, uh, is the defini definition sorry, of a scientific impact? It is a real uh, issue. Yesterday we spoke about it, and there is a reflection on this. The uh, impact factors are there, they're important, but what kind of... Uh, um, uh, impact factors. We have the scientific, uh, uh, actually, uh, impact, scientific, uh, endogamic, and uh, exogamic. Uh, uh, that is, say, the um, impact factor that is uh, really um, inside and the outside uh, exomac, exogamic. So we have uh, uh, the issue from uh, scientific to societal issues. It's the topic. Do we need to look at the discipline per se, or do we need to look at topics? Uh, that could be the thematics, topics, and they are completely different. If you look at uh, energetic uh, transition and uh, as a societal uh, issue and you uh, link it uh, to just society, you lose information that you thought were not linked to uh, energy, but they are linked to energy. So I think uh, it is better to have a, a focus on the topic rather than on the discipline. For the, el the older people like me, then you have the debate on the, the discipline versus the interdiscipline. What subject? Uh, su subject versus intersubjects. 
Is the uh, purely uh, scientific impact, is it just a societal? Does it just have a societal impact? So I'm, st I'm getting into scientific uh, reflections here that uh, haven't been solved. If I synthesize now on the impact, you all know the H index. It is a discipline view on of uh, scientific impact. It's endogamic. Uh, scholars talk to scholars about scholars' stories, so it's very very, very uh, uh, entre soi, and you need to read. It's very good if you can uh, correct all the biases to assess scientific impact of a colleague or university or, or, or a region. But we are seeing other indexes that are emerging as alternative solutions, uh, none of them being stabilized. The, uh, they're not the impact uh, factor alternative we should use. Now they are exogamic, that is say, uh, th through which channels uh, research diffuses to reach society. Individually, we can all do it. I wrote a book uh, so that uh, three consultant uh, uh, firm and two uh, uh, local representatives, uh, very, they were very interested in my uh, research, and then they developed uh, uh, public policies uh, that were inspired by what I wrote. So each individual can do it. So we have a few tools that are emerging, like the alt metric software uh, that uh, captures dissemination through uh, quotation uh, and social uh, medias. So it is a metric score, how, long, how many times your research was quoted on uh, uh, on uh, uh, social uh, networks and social media. We can see also on the Leiden platform, the CWTS, we can see uh, reference scores also that are more focused on discipline and topics rather than on individuals. They have a score on society impact, on policy reports, industry reports in uh, social media, and in uh, classic uh, newspapers. So we are taking the assumption that uh, there is a societal impact when there is a research on the uh, increase of uh, soil temperature in Occitanie. It's going to be published in La Dépêche du Midi, the local newspaper, but it's going to be spread out for the readers of the uh, Dépêche du Midi uh, on Sunday morning. Then you have the narratives. It's really the research units that are using them. Uh, they are being developed at the uh, Council for Assessing Research, Conseil d'Evaluation de la Recherche, which was really broadly developed in the, the United Kingdom. The idea is that an individual is going to produce a report to be assessed as a narrative, and those narratives have to convince the assessor so that the scientific impact is going to be spread out through these different channels we spoke about and will have a very strong societal impact. Uh, there is no index here, it's just storytelling. You explain through uh, your individual strategy or lab strategy, you uh, made sure that your research wasn't just scholars talking to st scholars but had a real society impact. And all this uh, comes within the framework of the San Francisco Declaration, uh, the OARA and Leiden Manifesto uh, that uh, invite uh, all research institutions, labs, university to develop their own system of alternative measures uh, to research uh, and to assess performance. So this uh, gave you the context uh, on how we uh, think, how we carry out our reflection on the scientific and societal signature. On the debate uh, discipline subject, uh, the uh, idea is that the societal impact is better assessed through a scientometric approach than on the traditional approach of a clarivate discipline, 
by uh, discipline. So now we have uh, discipline versus topic. Uh, the challenges today are very complex and they cannot be just uh, dealt with uh, on COVID, for example, when we uh, just uh, epidemiologists, uh, there is, uh, we had to uh, implement it on uh, uh, the health uh, policies. So uh, the societal impact of research is better assessed by topic-based bibliometric analysis. Today we are going maybe too far, and the disciplinary impact, uh, pure impact, is now questioned. Why? Because we have scientific challenges that are treated only and financed only under the interdisciplinary it's going to dry out of uh, the disciplinary excellence. So we can go too far. Uh, all discipline, if you have too much, um, not enough, you should find the average and the good balance. Research funders, uh, agency regions, they are really asking uh, for methodologies to measure the scientific impact of interdisciplinary researches. Uh, the research work I find very interesting on the web of science uh, of uh, the main findings of Wang and his uh, colleagues uh, in 2015. They work on the uh, scientific impact of uh, interdisciplinary research. I call them sleeping beauties. He thinks of three types of interdisciplinarity in a single impact analysis. Each and each of them uh, has an impact in the de spreading out of uh, scientific studies. It could be a variety. Uh, in its reference list, um, a publication, if, it's, if it mobilizes about 50 references coming from 15 uh, dis uh, scientific disciplines, or inversely, that we only have two disciplines being tackled. So this is the variety index. It is very flat, this index. Another index is the balance. How is the uh, reference list being spread? If we have five disciplines, is, do we have one central one? In a round publication, there were 80 references from economists and 20% a bit of sociology, a bit of anthropology, a bit of history, a bit of this and that. So a third factor that we know very well when you look at uh, economy is the, uh, the uh, difference, the cognitive index between uh, disciplines that are quoted in this reference list. To be trivial, uh, the uh, publications that are huge progresses are the a uh, mix of uh, the disciplines that used to work together who are all they're working together for the first time. They are mobilized to work together in a common research program. So the results are very interesting because in 2014, it takes all these subjects with the whole of the world science and it studies the impact 13 years later. And the scientific impact, societal impact of these publications uh, increases according to the variety of them. The more uh, the disciplines are being tackled, the better and the stronger the impact, but it decreases with the balance. If there is not really a, a core discipline, it's like a, really it's lost and uh, it has too many disciplines and too many subjects being tackled. Inversely, in, on short-term basis, uh, variety and disparity have a negative effect. So in interdisciplinary in researches, interdisciplinary researches, you have sleeping beauty publications, which in fact is very uh, late, happens late, but it's very strong. So you need to have a strong difference. Uh, so that there is a, a strong interest to encourage this interdisciplinary, but you shouldn't push it too far either because too, uh, dis too much distance kills the efficiency of the uh, uh, 
uh, working together. And it uh, kills this, um, this uh, positive relationship between disparity and long-term impact, suggests that encouraging interdisciplinary research from distant disciplines needs, uh, really needs a core discipline. We're saying the negative relationship between balance and impact may suggest that the most effective interdisciplinary research strategy in terms of generating impact is to have the, the core discipline and simultaneously uh, borrowing knowledge from other disciplines rather than drawing knowledge equally from multiple disciplines. I'll come back now to the uh, CWTS, the Leiden mythology. It is a, a research unit from a Leiden University uh, uh, scientometric uh, uh, specialists throughout the world and recognize as such. And they use a, a, a detection algorithm uh, that is very known, community detection algorithm. It has been developed throughout the world for all the scientific research to try to go beyond uh, beyond measuring uh, the impact of scientific uh, uh, approaches uh, like Shanghai topics that were looking at the best labs and best universities uh, compared to the web of science. So all this is based on the clusters, clustering uh, methodology using a co-quotation analysis of the, uh, it's like co-occurrences, ref bibliography references in, in um, publications. If Ron quotes three references that I will also quote, our publications could be found in the same clusters in the same topics. So we uh, have a contract with Leiden University. They didn't give us the world uh, ba database, but the extraction of uh, data for West uh, Occitanie region. I will call it later O Square. So we didn't build up the uh, Toulousean cluster. We we looked at uh, the position of Toulouse in these world clusters, clusters. Sorry, and so we could extract the scientific signature for the west of uh, Occitanie. And very interestingly, from this data, we can go back to disciplines. Those disciplines, you can see it on the colours. They are affiliated to five main topics, uh, life and earth, math and computer science, physical sciences and engineering, and uh, social sciences and humanities. Uh, the publications date back from 2017 to 2000, and, uh, sorry, publication 2010, 2020, and quotation 2018 to 2020. As you can see here, the list of topics for Toulouse, for the west of, uh, there is a rolling, uh, scrolling menu, and uh, uh, Toulouse is present for uh, 400 clusters. We're not on all clusters. Then you can see here the numbers of uh, papers for the uh, Toulouse University sites entities, and all the, so then the affiliations with the disciplines. You have all the publications, more than 100,000, I think, or 80,000. I have forgotten, depends on the parameters you enter. Then you have a landscape that appears, scientific landscape of Toulouse, without any surprise, all uh, uh, topics being closed, they all get together and they're linked to their proximity. So those are the results. I'm only showing you three. Look at, uh, we, you can read this type of graph, graphism. We really talk about topics here. We're coming out completely from uh, what we did uh, earlier at uh, universities in Toulouse through disciplinary to convince uh, a jury that we're the best in France. Here we're talking about topics. Here, extreme weather events, for example. Uh, it's a whole a series of uh, uh, Toulouse publication affiliated to Life and Earth, and you find sociology and geography in these publications, and they were really published in a, a web of science uh, in economy, uh, in an economist uh, review. So here, um, the extreme weather events research represents 13 to 14 percent of national research on the topic, and the average is more 4 
and four to five percent. So there is a strong specialization for Toulouse in extreme weather events. Shanghai didn't tell us that we knew it, but we didn't. And it represents 1.35 percent of the world research. It seems to be nothing, but it is more than one percent of world research. It is something. 400 topics for Toulouse. Here I'm showing you only 25, and then we don't have a really uh, uh, room to uh, express. So we. 25 subjects amongst 400. They are the most remarkable subjects for Toulouse topics. Sorry. Another type of representation. Just a, s a small note. All the topics here have one impact factor that is equal to the average f uh, impact factor at the world level. You might have topics where the percentage is higher, but they're not. They're less quoted in Toulouse. Uh, the, you can't really uh, see them, and uh, they're losing their uh, no sit they're not as noti noticeable. Now let's look at the um, uh, quotation variable. The publications on this subject are 2.5 uh, percent more quoted in Toulouse than in the rest of the world, which is a lot. So topics here are different. And if we want to be happy in Toulouse, very few uh, publications on geography and innovation, 55, but 2.5% uh, more quoted in uh, Toulouse than anywhere else in the world. So a small mass, but at national level, Toulouse isn't really noticeable, 6.5% uh, in innovation, geography and innovation. So just above average. I'm going to show you quickly. There is a way building up uh, an algorithm to go back to disciplines. Why did we do this? Because the Shanghai disciplinary uh, classification has a strong bias of these five criteria and all the thresholds, IECT papers, the 1% that are most quoted, are extremely exclusive. If we take a linear approach, we can see that Toulouse wasn't classified for aerospace engineering in Shanghai. And you think, how come? How come Toulouse will not be classified by the Shanghai uh, classification? 330 in engineering aerospace engineering with an uh, impact factor. 1.5 percent, 50 percent uh, more quotation to lose, and 14.5 percent uh, of uh, national impact. Once we have corrected this uh, noble approach and uh, the uh, really the uh, size of communities, the signature is a lot more. Uh, you find oceanography, meteorology, because a Meteo France research uh, site is in Toulouse and uh, wasn't, isn't very well classified by Shanghai classification, but here uh, comes up uh, very well and uh, it shows really a lot better the uh, um, skills of uh, Toulouse. Olivier Brossard. So this is work that we carried out with uh, Olivier Brossard, the EI index. Uh, this. Uh, Sorry, donates memories for you. Now, uh, this was uh, uh, interesting uh, studies, but uh, the the disciplines that have uh, EI indexes over here that are high. In other words, in Toulouse, this discipline is more likely to interact with other disciplines than itself. Is this impact higher or lower? So here. This um, dot cloud is not obvious, but the regression line tells us at least it's not because these disciplines uh, tend to work more with other disciplines than their own that they will have a lower impact. Quite the opposite, because uh, this regression is slightly positive. Now, there's no shape, but uh, there's no law that comes out of it, and it's only Toulouse on top of it, so uh, you probably noted this. So it is interesting and in the database, we see how often a discipline interacts with its own discipline or with another. 
Uh, we even take this a little bit f further and we do the uh, network analysis and uh, we consider ties between uh, disciplines. Now these ties uh, being the topics they have in common in this uh, topics database. And so we have all the links between disciplines of the same field, so in the same color, and we only look into the disciplines that will go and affect disciplines of another domain. So the HS with life science, uh, med science with computer science. We're outside of their, their field. And so we have a certain number of uh, disciplines that are extremely uh, structuring in this interdisciplinarity and others are not quite. All these over here aren't. Uh, these over here are more or less and some are more than others. If we look at SHS, for instance, educational research here, this is doesn't come as a surprise because this has to do with psychology or psychiatry, uh, with uh, med science, uh, economics also works a lot with uh, uh, maths and computer science. In terms of SHS, here we have archaeology, of course, works a lot with uh, uh, science pertaining to uh, land, earth. And um, here, of course, we have an interregional approach, so we can see ties with Bordeaux, Montpellier and others. Um, I'd like to wrap up fairly swiftly now, if I may. I don't know if we've got enough time. Okay, so this is a preliminary study. It was uh, the object of an annex, a five-page uh, uh, appendix in the uh, amongst the uh, Excellence uh, Initiative response, and it was uh, quite well appreciated by the jury. Um, so this was uh, uh, so developed for this uh, call for a national I initiative of research excellence at the city level. And um, it's the region over here which paid for the database. But it uses this database in order to build with academia. Uh, we will carry on financing and co-financing the setting up of a longitudinal dashboard for the scientific uh, signature of the site. So in order to identify um, funding, um, in order to uh, uh, ensure that, uh, well, um, help fundings arrive in Toulouse because that's where it may emerge best. This change in paradigm, including from those uh, uh, um, uh, research sponsors, I mean, there's a number of social challenges and um, the, the topic is uh, now um, the, the, the scientomatic approach rather than discipline or excellence. And uh, if you, you know, I don't know, take a subscription to uh, uh, the science, uh, science uh, uh, magazine, you'll see this very clearly. And then, of course, um, we need to have a very much a disciplinary approach to under identify the key disciplines which uh, uh, have an impact on the emergence of these topics because... Uh, um, uh, and then what are the structuring di uh, disciplines that structure um, more than others? If we take, for instance, a topic which does not connect to many disciplines but only one, such as economics, why uh, finance it as a whole? Because if this topic here and elsewhere uh, refers to a, a core discipline that can be uh, uh, isolated. Uh, the, the funding should go to the establishment, rather. Um, but maybe uh, the idea is to have uh, more general funding. Okay, so these are questions that remain. What grain is best suited to... Uh, analyze these topics to see research dynamics emerge. So this was a question I, I, uh, I asked yesterday. Uh, this was a question we had with Ron yesterday. At what level? I uh, tend to defend the micro-grain, the micro-analysis of a micro-region to try and help the public uh, players to create more uh, efficient incentive schemes. But as Ron said yesterday, 
and uh, you, you you imagine that uh, I'm, I, I, I uh, made my slides after Ron's presentation, but it is difficult to uh, explain to policymakers uh, the number of emerging scientific topics. Uh, and also, uh, pertaining to yesterday's discussion, how can we connect um, a scientific uh, topic uh, data to uh, patent data in order to uh, understand where the uh, transfer failures and strengths are? Uh, because uh, uh, that way, common detection algorithm and category uh, definitions uh, would uh, make this connection uh, tractable. And so uh, there is... Uh, if you look at science publication and patents, well, uh, you may see how you've uh, built, co-constructed the uh, semantics. And in fact, I find it difficult to see how, what we could do for, uh, well, uh, for the region to uh, analyze uh, the, the, the failures uh, in transfer. Uh, I forgot one extension, but it doesn't really matter because the reason isn't here. But uh, we need to extend from Occitanie West to all of Occitanie, if we want the region to, to give us uh, money to do it. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> uh, off mic. Uh, thank you very much. So um, we've got um, five minutes, a little more to take questions. Jerome, maybe just to start uh, the discussion, could you maybe... Uh, come back to what you said a little bit fast, I must say. You mentioned the way uh, within which this data is used, how you use this data, and how this uh, enabled you to change uh, the vision uh, that would, for instance, the Shanghai classification give. And um, what, 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 what are, where do these uh, differences come from? What bias do you, do you correct? Two things here. There is something that we do that Shanghai doesn't do, which is to identify uh, strong topics in terms of national share, uh, impact factor and um, global share. This is something that Shanghai doesn't do and it is justified by the fact that these uh, uh, calls to excellence initiatives ask uh, you tell you position yourself on societal challenges and not on discipline as would have been the case with the ANR 10 years ago. Uh, for Shanghai now, because I, I, I did this work, I um, looked into the disciplines. I'm not going to come back to the platform slide, but uh, a bit like every paper for every topic is allocated to uh, to a journal, and uh, this it pertains to a discipline. I uh, made the link with the disciplines, but not with the five criteria of Shanghai. So 1%, number of 10%, the most quoted in a, in a, in a university, or Nobel Prizes and fields, and there are three or four uh, rewards. Uh, there is a size criteria, and um, there are five, I forgot one. But if I remove all these criteria and I take uh, just a standard quote criteria without what's uh, flashy on the Nobels or the IECT, I get something very different from Shanghai. And we had a problem in Toulouse for, for many years in aerospace engineering, but also in, uh, in uh, uh, weather forecasting. Uh, you don't see economics either. Economics is somewhere over, over here. You can't see it. It's part of the 50 remarkable, but it's on position 30 or 40, depending on uh, how you, you uh, look at this. So um, you have the size effect here because TSC is small, but it is uh, classified but it is overweighted as compared to a, uh, a classification without any uh, discriminating elements. Do we have any questions? Okay, yes, this is not directly linked to the discussion, but do you have any information on the project and where it stands? 
Well, the answer is it's likely to be in July. 28th of June, we have a, a ministry uh, meeting with uh, ANR and uh, all the deciders. It goes to the Prime Minister's uh, office and then the uh, uh, Prime Minister decides on when it's best uh, from a political standpoint. So, you know, uh, you the idea is to avoid uh, having, uh, you know, bottlenecks or, or, or void. So I, I'd say sometime after the 28th of June. But, you know, that's my opinion and I make many mistakes. for a, a, a very interesting uh, talk. Um, okay, I think, uh, and, and I, I'm always a bit uncomfortable with the, uh, with the notion of topics, right? So, uh, because um, it's good that uh, we might leave a bit behind the focus on disciplines, but at the same time, you were also mentioning that, uh, um, yeah, uh, many of uh, uh, scientific research is still very much rooted uh, in disciplines and departments that represent uh, disciplines. And, um, and I would be a bit reluctant to give that up and just go for topics. I see that happening in the Netherlands and I'm not very optimistic about how, what is going on there. I mean, it's, uh, it's the whole uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, um, focusing research funding on social <coughs> challenges, right? And, and more or less everybody's doing the same. Right, and this is, I think, uh, a, 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 an extreme waste of of public money, right? So, because uh, most projects will fail because they do, they, they they lack the expertise. They have, they, of course, they have good narratives, right? So, when they apply uh, and they write proposals, they hire consultants and then they get the funding, uh, but they have no expertise whatsoever, uh, and and this is happening. Right? And this is happening not only on a very minor scale, it's happening on a very large and massive scale. Because this is the fashion, right? Go for topics. So, uh, uh, so I'm a bit reluctant to go into this direction. So I'm not saying that, of course, what you want to do is to show excellence, right? On those topics and which institutes actually matter in that respect. Uh, and, and to what extent you also have to connect uh, to other disciplines. I don't think that... Uh, um, uh, the issue is that we should look beyond our own disciplines, right? So uh, I think that is very good. Uh, um, I mean, uh, 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 and, and maybe your analysis could also show that uh, the disciplines that 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 keep on um, uh, inward looking, following an inward looking approach, like maybe economics, uh, just to uh, uh, to name uh, to name one. Uh, 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 example um, might be bad for the for the for the field itself, right? So, so in that sense, I think it's good to go beyond the boundaries and to go uh, and, and 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 encourage interdisciplinary research. And then I think this type of the, this type of research, I think, is very welcoming. Okay, what type of interdisciplinary research uh, uh, produ produce the best scientific output? So that I think that is that is that is a great question to take up. But then immediately to jump on the focus on topics in order to, uh, uh, to ensure that disciplines are working together, right? Because that is the whole idea about the topic, right? Okay, okay, there is a demand from society at the one hand, but also that uh, it's also very much driven by the fact that uh, one discipline cannot solve one particular societal problem, but you have to collaborate across uh, different disciplines, right? Um, Okay, then, then, that, then that is happening. I think this, this type of scientometric analysis could be very relevant and useful to actually show that this, this might not work, right? So uh, that uh, indeed if you have a topic-based approach, uh, you bring different people from disciplines, uh, diff disciplines because that is the fashion, and then you will see that many of those projects will just fail because uh, people might not have the excellence, and secondly, because they are not used to collaborate among different disciplines, and therefore uh, uh, they will fail to produce any scientific output. So in that sense, this, this type of research, I think, can be, can, could be, could be really, very relevant. Um, okay, I think I stopped talking. I think it's just a comment and not so much a question.
Uh, but there are, I, I'm, I'm really worried about some of these kind of trends uh, that are happening in, our, in, in, in science in more in general. And I'm very much involved in, in this kind of debates in the Netherlands. And I'm, I'm, I feel that I'm, that I'm only one of the few that is actually addressing these type of critiques while everybody's just going in the same direction without thinking too much what might be the consequences of that. Oh, je, je partage complètement. Well, I totally agree, and this is why I said that the trend uh, is pushing way too far uh, social issues, uh, interdisciplinarity, and uh, uh, topic versus discipline. And um, in Toulouse, we've had uh, a lot of uh, disputes and, and uh, discussions. Uh, Uh, for instance, some representatives of uh, major research units, so uh, uh, disciplines, were totally against the work I was carrying out. And in fact, I forgot to mention, because this was done with Mike Toupis and Pierre Benoit Joly. Um, Pierre Benoit Joly, uh, by the way, was uh, pushing hard for a uh, topic, topic, and uh, he was more about, uh, he, you know, he was for. He would say, just forget disciplines. And so we didn't quite disagree. And this is why I uh, try and get uh, disciplines out. And this goes along the lines of what you said. There's a true engineering approach for research. Um, and we need to uh, see in real life what are the disciplines that structure local communities. Then we can see, look at this globally as well. But this slide here is not... I mean, because basically I didn't get the majority, but this does not reflect the initial call, uh, answer to the call for excellence, because it is too disciplinary, yes. And so you, you are, you know, uh, making the message unclear, and the message we should have passed on is the message that you defend, Ron. Yes, the impact on society uh, of our research for uh, financiers cannot be disciplines, it's not relevant, but you will not have a society impact if you do not maintain incentives for a disciplinary input. And this is a message which, um, could you remind us how this is built? Uh, what links the, uh, so disciplines are linked together when on, in, on site in Toulouse they share a, a common topic. So in publications where scientists are, okay, are co-authors, good, yes. And over here, we only consider the links when these disciplines are outside of the field, so basically of the color code. So you will see no square of the same color connected. I have one which is more uh, complex, where you have uh, uh, Scandinavian literature with non-Scandinavian literature and so on and so forth. But all these disciplines here, so geology, for instance, has got nothing to do with a discipline which is outside of uh, um, earth science. I think we had a question here from Delio. It's going to be a difficult question, I can, uh, I can tell you straight away. No, 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 don't worry. Okay, so obviously this is extremely interesting, as you, as you know. But uh, maybe I'll make comments, because we have this discussion, topic, discipline, interdisciplinarity. And I believe there are mistakes here, because we could analyze, do a topic analysis and identify uh, discipline topics. And it is not because we are in a topic analysis that we are necessarily in the interdisciplinarity. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And by the way, most of these topics are, are in Toulouse and maybe somewhere else. No, it's not the case. Exactly. And that's why, as regards what Laurent presented yesterday, I believe it is much more interesting. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. It is more interesting in the sense that... We do not have any topics imposed by the classification. And so we have uh, something which is much more uh, fine-tuned and we will be able to analyze it because this type of identification will put us in line with the existing resources uh, uh, in the territory. And so we will see a certain type of aeronautic uh, development in Toulouse because we have the human resources on site. So just... Um, 
So just uh, yeah, I just wanted to make this little comment pertaining to the importance of the topic, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, uh, of course, we have interdisciplinarity, and I totally agree that uh, on the fact that too much interdisciplinarity, just for the the sake of it, is not necessarily good. Uh, what we see in our discussions is that uh, the ins and outs of a uh, research action, what we call recherche action, research action, some define it differently, but basically a research whose first action is to uh, provide something to society. Um, this is something which exists, and when I see that uh, the scientific policy of the INRAE University, they... Uh, are much more involved in action research than uh, the CNRS. So there's a very strong link on interdisciplinarity and societal impact. Uh, if you take the opposite at the CNRS, their goal, uh, they are not interested in the direct impacts on society. They are more interested in the accumulation of fundamental knowledge. They are less interested in interdisciplinarity, although they do have a mission here. And so the data shows this. Most topics are sometimes uh, monodisciplinary, and the algorithm doesn't detect interdisciplinarities, but topics by co-reference in the different topic lists. So it's interesting to see the topics, because I have another slide where, where topics... And we see how topics are connected through disciplines. But all uh, topics do not connect several disciplines. Uh, and including the one I mentioned, you know, geographic autoaccumulation. It, it is slightly connected to um, sociology, but uh, full stop. It is totally in geography, and it is slightly in touch with uh, um, economics, but it is mainly in geography. And I totally agree with what you just said. You shouldn't think that uh, the algorithm here the Leiden algorithm, when it spots these communities or, or topics, it, it doesn't have a bias in favour of interdisciplinarity. Uh, yes, I, I much prefer this type of representation, as you know, because not quite... I mean, the categories are quite closed here, and they do not show the uh, potential links that may exist between topics and disciplines. And this, I believe, is very interesting, as you know. And um, development possibilities, because we have resources that can be implemented for the development in order pu to push certain topics forward. Uh, but this is yes, something... Uh, I mean, fewer studies, more research... Yes, the ambition we, we may we could have, because this is a, a study from Toulouse, focused on Toulouse, and sometimes uh, I dream uh, of uh, a collaboration between five or six big uh, European uh, universities who've all answered excellent initiatives to uh, change uh, uh, their approach to work by priority. And uh, we could take a longitudinal approach and see if this turns out results. Because what I see, uh, I mean, apologies, this is amongst us. People just take their money and carry on doing what they believe is the best, and rightly so, uh, for their scientific impact, because it impacts their career and so on and so forth. But personally, if I take Toulouse, we can clearly see the strategies of the disciplines to impact. So it goes uh, along what Ron says. Uh, scientists will carry on playing their disciplinary um, strategy if they believe it's the one that will generate most uh, funding. Um, reversely, some communities have a, a natural trend for interdisciplinarity and they are not part of academic structures that can implement them. So I, t I believe it is good to find an added value to the existing discipline for those who have a natural trend to uh, break the borders of their discipline. That's how I see it. And it's not how this is not how the chairman of our university sees it, but I see it that way. And it would be interesting to compare with other uh, major universities and see how uh, their landscape is uh, structured. Maybe we're slightly over time. Thank you very much once again.
Okay. Uh, uh, welcome to the uh, the second speaker of uh, this morning, uh, uh, Short Hardeman, who I know already uh, for a very long time. Uh, 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 used to be my PhD student uh, at Utrecht University, and uh, actually uh, was very much on the topic that we discussed this morning, right on the, on scientific collaborations and science industry relationships. So uh, and the geography of that. So, uh, 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 but he moved uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, forward, let's put it like that, and uh, um, um, now working for uh, uh, one of the major uh, banks in the Netherlands, uh, Rabobank, uh, my own bank, uh, so, uh, and, um, and he's doing a, a fantastic work over there because he's part of a research unit. Right, so he does not have to count uh, the money, but uh, he really actually doing uh, research uh, uh, on, on many topics. Uh, and one of them is uh, uh, on the indicator of social well-being. Right, so, and this is a topic uh, that, uh, that is if, uh, of very much interest to all of us, especially uh, uh, thinking about the legacy of uh, Bernard Maris, uh, uh, thinking about uh, economics in a more broader sense, uh, that we also have to think about uh, new types of indicators in order to grasp uh, what uh, actually uh, uh, or how to assess uh, the well-being of citizens and, and just an, uh, uh, take an economic dimension and uh, even worse just by uh, one uh, uh, indicator GDP uh, that we are using uh, quite a lot till today. Um, we, maybe we have to go beyond that and uh, include all kinds of other dimensions that citizens actually care about. Uh, of course, they care about the economic state of affairs, but there are many more dimensions uh, that, we, that we should account for in order to, uh, uh, to understand more uh, uh, what it means, well-being of, of citizens, um, and how we can help them uh, or we can help uh, 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 policymakers. Uh, in order to get better indicators to, uh, uh, to support their own uh, policies. Um, and then I'm uh, talking about uh, issues of health, uh, issues of uh, the uh, environment, environmental quality, etc., etc. So those should be taken on board because citizens care about that. Um, and, and, and we should account for that. And, Sh and Stuart is an expert on that, right? So he's uh, involved in, uh, in, in, in research uh, uh, on that at the Rabobank, but also in collaboration with Utrecht University. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, Stuart will uh, uh, say much more about that uh, because this is a, he, he will present some results of a study that has been done in collaborations uh, with many others uh, within our university uh, at Utrecht, but also beyond that. Uh, and I think it's very interesting research and, uh, and, and, uh, and making a step forward in order to see to what extent we can actually measure the well-being of citizens and what is the geography and how, uh, how does the geography look like. Uh, um, and, and studies have been done on the Netherlands already for some years, so we can also already make some uh, dynamic analysis on that. But of course, I am already talking too much. Uh, because Shoot will uh, 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 comment on that and will talk about that much more in detail. So I'm very happy, Shoot, that you could make it. Uh, not easy nowadays to take flights, uh, but uh, uh, very happy that you are here and uh, we are uh, looking forward to your uh, talk. Thanks, Ron. Um, me as well, very happy to be here. Um, yes, there it is. Um, I'd like to talk to you about beyond, going beyond GDP, exploring the geography of sustainable well-being in the Netherlands. And um, actually, I don't have many solutions, but I want you to remember three questions, three takeaway questions, and I think something went wrong with the layout, but that's okay. First question is, what does it actually mean when we speak of regional development? And for whom? This last part, actually, I didn't come up with myself. I took it from a paper, I think, by Andy Pike and some others in regional studies some years ago. Um, second question I'd like to address, and again, I don't know whether I really have definite, conclusive answers, but at least I think it's good to think about it. 
what does our notion of regional development mean for the way we measure it, or we should or could measure it? And then the third question, which I feel is of most importance, especially for policymakers, is what then does our metric or our metrics mean um, of, regional de of, of, of regional development for how we do, how we construct regional policies? Again, I'd like to stress, I don't think I have definite answers, but at least I feel that these three questions offer a fruitful starting point to have a debate on how to move forward in regional development and, and, and especially policy making therein. <clears throat> a little bit more about myself. Um, Ron's always stressing that I did my PhD at Utrecht University, but he forgets often that after two years indeed at Utrecht University, I moved to Eindhoven University of Technology where I finished my PhD. <laughs> um, but I think in the citation and in the funding game, he's very eager to, uh, <laughs> to get the credits for Utrecht University. Um, I did my PhD indeed in economics of science and technology. And indeed, my topic was very much about what Jerome was just talking about. Um, again, there are also... Basically, the, the research question I addressed was how can we steer research excellence to have some social impact? Um, it was very much in an infancy state, I'd say. Uh, the field has moved forward ever since. Um, but I'm very happy to see your presentation just, uh, just now. Um, after I did my PhD, I moved to the European Commission, where I worked in, uh, in Ispra in Italy for three years. And when I came there, I started with the assignment of measuring research excellence at the regional level. Because not just me during my PhD, I was interested in measuring excellence and in explaining excellence, uh, so what drives excellence in research. Um, but apparently also the European Commission was interested in that and wanted to have figures for at, at the national level and at the regional level in Europe. Um, I forgot to mention one thing, and is that why I was interested in science and technology in innovation in the first place. This is very much, I, I mean, in my view, was very much... Um, starting with the notion that, okay, if we talk about development, we often talk about economic growth. And we all know from the work of Robert Solov and, and, and afterwards then, that technical progress is a huge determinant of economic growth. So that legitimizes basically why we should delve deeper into what's going on inside the black box of technology development. So that's what I did during my PhD, and then I moved to European Commission and basically did the same there. Halfway through my contract at the European Commission, I switched from measuring research excellence at the national and regional level towards measuring human development at the regional level. And at that point, I didn't know much about human development, what it was, what do we mean by it. But I feel that there's one commonality with the whole debate on research excellence. It's basically that you start asking, okay, what do we mean by value creation in the first place? And then start asking, okay, and then how can we measure that at whatever level, be it firms, regions, or countries as a whole? In 2016, I went to, uh, to Rabo Research, which is indeed the research department of Rabobank, one of three bigger banks in the Netherlands, apart from ABN and ING, um, and also worldwide, a large food and agri bank. 
<clears throat> when I came there, there was a particular slogan, marketing slogan of Rabobank, saying the mission that we have at Rabobank is to grow a better world together, which immediately, given my experience also at the European Commission, made me question, okay, what then do I actually mean by better in growing a better world together? For me, definitely it's not GDP, gross domestic product or growth in GDP. Um, why not? First, because not all that people deem valuable gets measured through GDP. There's lots that people deem valuable that's not inside GDP. But the other way around also holds. That not all that gets measured by GDP is not deemed valuable at all by people, or at least not so much as it, uh, the way it enters in GDP. GDP doesn't take into account distributional issues. Um, so there's a kind of trickle-down assumption that whenever GDP goes up, everyone in society benefits from it. <clears throat> and it also neglects diversity, diversity among people, in the sense that it assumes it's also part of the trickle-down assumption that everyone indeed can actually, from their personal or environmental or social characteristics, um, benefit from all that is produced in a country or a region. For example, um, and this, this is an example taken from the works of uh, Amartya Sen, the Indian economist. Um, <clears throat> when you give people a bike, not all people can ride that same bike because some simply lack legs to use that bike. So not all that is produced can, in fact, even if it would be distributed equally across people, not all that gets produced can help um, all people equally. There is a diversity issue there. Um, there's also a kind of what I then call a trickle-up issue. There's some kind of assumption that whenever we produce more, whenever we increase GDP, then our well-being will, so basically putting well-being on top, will um, follow automatically. But of course, as you as economists perfectly know, there are negative externalities to production, also of course positive externalities, and there's also a lot uh, about non-market production. For example, taking care of family uh, during illness uh, instead of sending them to the hospital immediately uh, is not part of GDP, whilst it might, well, it might, might be part of our, of our well-being, of our welfare in a broader sense. <clears throat> Final thing. Or there are many more things that are wrong, let's say, with GDP. Is especially at the regional level. So if you look at cross regional products, um, then of course growth in GDP doesn't take into account interregional relationships. For example, you don't have to live in Toulouse. Um, to work in Toulouse. So you can enjoy, let's say, life outside Toulouse and still work in Toulouse where you earn your income. Usually this is not taken into account. This point of um, GDP being a wrong measure of our Welfare was indeed already recognized by one of its core developers, namely Simon Kuznets, later a, a, a Nobel Prize winner, who says that the welfare of a nation can scarcely be, be, be inferred from a measure of national income. <clears throat> 
still when we look at regional development, you see GDP entering the debate there very often, I'd say. I took this graph actually from, well, translated into English, from um, uh, a policy paper uh, in, in one of the Dutch provinces, namely Zealand, which is in the southwest, bordering the North Sea. Um, and they, they, yes, they take welfare and well-being on top, but then if you look at um, what their policy actions are really about, they mainly focus on these aspects. So, what they then call gross regional products. They look at labor productivity. They look at employment figures. And they look at what they then call the sources of competitiveness. So, research and development, foreign direct investment, state of infrastructure, state of human capital in a region, and the state of institutions and social networks in a, in a, in a region. And they assume, again, like what's often done with gross uh, domestic product as well, that when you focus on these key sources of competitiveness, then the rest and ultimately welfare and well-being, so there will be a trickle-up effect as if it were uh, going from these sources to welfare and well-being. If we don't take GDP for granted, what then should or could regional development be about? I think we have to think much more in terms of a sustainable or social well-being framework. The framework, to me, again, I borrowed this from um, uh, the works of Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, uh, others, uh, Ingrid Robijns in the Netherlands and, uh, and Belgium, basically has three elements. One is resources, the other capabilities, and finally there are functionings. Resources are not an end in itself, but it's a means to achieve capabilities, which are the real opportunities that people have to live the life they deem valuable themselves. And then the third element we have is functionings, which is about what people actually achieved. So their actual achievement is there. Notice the difference between capabilities and functionings. I feel that in the end, policy should be much more about steering capabilities. Also because there's, let's say, a normative difference between, also a moral difference between um, steering functionings and capabilities. Because with functionings, basically, you, you kind of oblige people what to achieve. Think of the difference between seeking um, that people have the opportunity to be healthy. It's different from basically obliging everyone to be healthy. There's still a choice element in there. and So that's the moral difference also between capabilities and functionings. Still, what functioning, what capabilities are turned into functionings, then again, like in the negative externalities, have a feedback effect on resources being available, let's say, in a new iteration. Right? Think of when we drive a car, there are emissions, and these emissions have an effect on the natural environment, uh, so also affect natural resources being available in the future. So basically, these are the three elements, core elements, I'd say, of what regional development should be about, in my view. <coughs> of course, if you want, then want to measure these building blocks, these elements, we have to ask ourselves, okay, 
Should we measure resources? Should we measure capabilities? Should we measure functionings? In part, this is also a, let's say, pragmatic question in the sense that what kind of data is available to use these aspects? From this pra pragmatics, we started mainly measuring functionings first, simply due to a lack of data being available on measuring especially capabilities. But keep in mind that, in my view, in the end, it is about capabilities. Um, of course, both resources, capabilities and functionings all play out on various dimensions. It's not just about jobs and income, it's also about housing, it's also about well, we, we, we take 11 such dimensions. It's also about um, personal development or education. It's about health. It's about work-life balance. It's about community, sense of community, institutional quality. Uh, it's about housing, safety, and environmental quality. In principle, I'd say all these so resources, capabilities, and functions can play out on these various dimensions. <clears throat> to develop our metrics of functionings, remember what I said before, that we started measuring this at the level of functionings first, we used publicly available data being available from Statistics Netherlands um, and there we started measuring, especially functionings, I have to say. More recently, we started to measure capabilities as well. And we do this running a survey on over 10,000 people in the Netherlands aged 18 years and older. Uh, we do this yearly now. We did this last two, three years. The third version is coming up. Um, and what we did there to measure capabilities is simply ask people on a scale from one to seven, to what extent are you capable of having appropriate housing, of generating enough income, of uh, live your life in physical and mental safety, etc., etc. We did this for all these 11 dimensions. Of course, if you then want to have a metric of well-being, social well-being or sustainable well-being, you have to aggregate these measures in one way or the other. You have to also use weights in order to aggregate these various dimensions. We took these weights from stated preferences in that survey. So people basically stated what their preferences were on these 11 dimensions. We did this in two ways. We simply asked them to rate these dimensions on a scale from 1 to 10, 0 to 10 actually. That was one way, and the other way was to um, <clears throat> allocate 110 points to these 11 dimensions. There were not so much differences between these two methods. These were pretty much in line. But you can imagine that if you ask people to rate dimensions, then if you ask, is health important? Yes, health is important. Give it an 8 or a 9. If you ask, is the environment important? Yeah, the environment is also important. So basically, if you ask people to rate dimensions, then it's much more narrow um, the scores that you get for each of these dimensions. If you allocate points over 11 dimensions, then there's much more difference between the various dimensions. But in, if, if you then again rank these two, then these two methods are very much in line. <clears throat> Getting back to, to functionings, how we measure these, at the region and the national level is using public data again. So um, income, 
you find here, we use disposable income at the national or regional level. We look at job security by measuring uh, unemployment rates and uh, the percentage of contracts that are in flex jobs. Um, we, use pers we measure personal development by looking at the education level in regions or in the Netherlands as a whole. Uh, and we look as a kind of quality standard, we look at PISA scores at the national level. Health is measured by life expectancy. Uh, you see the other dimensions here, how we, um, how we measure them. If we then turn to this single index of, in this case, functionings, you see that the development of functionings over time, of this functionings index over time, very much differs from the development of GDP capita over time. We measured this from 2003 onwards till, well, the latest year presented here is 2019. In general, whenever a crisis occurs, GDP drops quite rapidly while this functionings index still um, continues to rise a little bit. So the effects of a crisis do not filter through into the functionings index immediately whenever a crisis sets in. The effect of a crisis usually follows a bit later. One of the reasons behind that is that there are trade-offs within the index between dimensions. So here you look at the cumulative contribution of various dimensions to the overall increase of the functionings index. So here you see the increase in the functionings index between 2013 and 2019. And you see that within that period, income and job security so disposable income, basically, uh, unemployment and the percentage of flex, flexible jobs um, had a huge positive contribution to the overall rise in the index. Well, at the same time, housing measured in terms of housing satisfaction dropped considerably during this period in the Netherlands. One of the main issues you might know in the Netherlands is indeed the housing market. Uh, um, especially youngsters not being able to buy a house, um, uh, to buy a first house, let's say. Another dimension that decreased during that period was work-life balance. So people started working more, experienced more job security, but at the same time, this came at the cost of their work-life balance. One way to take this is to look at this functionings index, what I call sustainable well-being or social well-being, as a much more balanced picture than simply looking at GDP growth or gross added value growth or simply looking at employment growth, so the number of jobs in a country or a region. Sorry, just, just, just one question. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, so these, I mean, these are, uh, I, I'm just wondering about the word of trade offs, right? Because you just show that, okay. Uh, what are the contributions of each of those indicators to the to the evolution of the index overall, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Trade-offs to me would be more about, okay, if you increase uh, wealth, uh, does that go along with uh, an increase in housing uh, satisfaction or not? Yeah. That is not shown here, right? Because then you, 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 make, the, you make the analysis, what is the trade-off between two of the indicators that are part of this index, right? So uh, whether there's a trade-off between the two. What, what we see here, I'm not sure whether I understand your question right, Ron. What we see here is the increase in the overall index 
the an index which is between zero and one, so rescaled on a scale from zero to one, between 2013 and 2019. These dimensions contributed positively to this. Oh, <laughs> Never okay. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 I have understood uh, what, what what is showing here, but I, I just want to say, okay, did you also do analysis in which you say, okay, if the job security satisfaction will increase? What what will be decreased because of that? Uh, so are, are, is there so what are really trade off between two of the indicators that are part of the index? Right? Do you see what I mean? So you mean basically a correlation between dimensions in the index? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, usually, there's um, uh, a negative correlation between the environment and income. Um, uh, yeah, which is not re well, which was the case during this period. Um, one reason, well, I take there is that we measure environment by um, the emission of small particles. Is this the English term, fine stuff? I think it's well, really small particles in the air, so dust, let's say. <laughs> um, and this was huge in the beginning of the 90s and decreased ever since in the Netherlands very rapidly. We saw, well, in fact, I know we saw it increasing a little bit again. I think it was since 2018. Um, but of course, there are well, in fact, this dimension environment is one of the dimensions we're still struggling with, with how to operationalize it in our, in our metrics. Uh, so it might give a slight, slightly, let's say, biased picture of how the environment is actually doing in the Netherlands. Um, but you're right on that if you just simply look at correlations across dimensions, then we see a negative correlation in general between between the environment and, for example, income. Um, one of the strike, well, one of the striking things from our analysis, I guess, is the regional differences in the Netherlands. Not so much that there are differences. I mean, we know that there are regional differences. Also, when we look at uh, production or when we look at uh, employment, well, back again. <laughs> But I think the striking feature of this map is that the highest functioning levels are not to be found in the most urban regions in the Netherlands. Uh, so it's not in Amsterdam, definitely not in Rotterdam. In fact, it's much more just around these most urban areas and obviously this has to do with negative externalities of production in these regions or of concentration more generally I'd say so you see that people are less safe in urban areas uh, the environment typically is in a lesser state and also the housing market problem is much more severe in urban areas in the Netherlands that could be a what I then call a boring neighbor effect. Again, well, production is might be mostly done in cities. People enjoy life much more just outside cities while still traveling, perhaps even on a daily basis, to the city to do their um, uh, to do their work. Um, 
I leave this for the moment. So again, and this this picture is is very much different from the usual picture that we see when we look at production. Uh, so here on the right uh, map, we see the development of um, a region contribution to GDP in the Netherlands. Uh, so in, in in percentage points. So typically in these orange, dark orange regions, in these dark orange regions, um, the contribution to GDP development is much more, it's much higher, but it need not be the same regions as the ones that are scoring high on, uh, on the functionings um, uh, index. What, what we see on this left gra uh, map is when it's dark purple, then both the contribution to GDP or to labor productivity in this case and um, the functionings level are lower than the national average. The dark orange, in that case, it's both higher. So both labor productivity in that region is higher than the national average as is the functionings level. The light purple is that labor productivity is lower than average, but the functionings level, sustainable well-being, is higher. And the light orange, so again Rotterdam, Amsterdam, yes, labor productivity is higher in those regions than the national average. But sustainable well-being, as, uh, as measured here in terms of functionings, is lower there. What about other resources and capabilities? I wrote other because I feel that, uh, especially when you talk of gross regional product, in fact, we are talking about a, research, uh, a resource already. It's not a goal in itself. It's a means to achieve other goals. <clears throat> this is still work in progress. Still, uh, for example, we, through that survey that I mentioned before, we also uh, measure um, how satisfied people are with their local amenities. So think about the availability of hospitals or uh, shops or um, cafes, pubs. Um, we see that this is very much correlated with the distance they experience to such amenities. So people far away from those amenities tend to be less satisfied with uh, amenities in, um, um, in general. It's a nice job to push the button every uh, <laughs> every once in a while. My, my level of well-being is going down. I hope you still get paid. <laughs> we also measured capabilities at the regional level, and well, here we have simply the average score. Uh, we normalize it on a scale from zero to one. What's striking to me that in general, well, we we see a picture that, let's say, at the borders of the country, uh, capabilities tend to be lower on average, but still the, the range is very small in the Netherlands. So in a sense, I'd say that people in the Netherlands, wherever they live, tend to have the same opportunities, which does not mean, but still, eh, we, we saw before that that, that, that does not mean that those capabilities, those opportunities are then also always translated into actual realizations, actual functionings. So there's something going on there as well. Um, one of the final slides. I feel that sustainable well-being as, uh, as an analytical framework Focusing on the three building blocks, resources, 
capabilities functionings offers a very rich perspective on what's going on with regional development or economic development in general. But it's not an easier one to handle for policymakers. Uh, there are trade-offs across building blocks. So what do, how do resources translate into capabilities, translate into functionings, and then feed back into resources again? I think this is, offers a, pol a, a real puzzle for policymakers. Also, how do trade-offs occur across dimensions? So, as in the example from Ron as well, um, environment versus income, for example. One note there is that you can look at the statistics, you can look at the correlations, as we just discussed. But a question that arises to me there is, are these relation these statistical relationships then also deterministic in other way um, if you find negative correlations there between environment and income does it also mean that it has to be that way right Do, does income have to come at a cost of the environment if we see that in the past it did this is not necessarily the case I feel but it does offer a challenge, I think, for policymakers to, let's say, reverse that correlation from being negative to turning it into being positive. And also the question, also the final question that I that, that I raised in the beginning: How, as a policymaker, should should you then use regional development metrics responsibly? Just. To show you final slides, I see people looking at their watches. <laughs> uh, what I found striking is that when we ask for stated preferences, yeah, you know, we use those preferences to aggregate the dimensions into a single index. Basically, this was the this was the ranking. So, health and subjective well-being were on top. Um, then safety, then housing and income, uh, social networks, social contacts across people, work-life balance, environment, well, you see the ranking there. But what we did later as well was to ask what are the biggest challenges for the region that you live in. You got a completely different picture. It's not that what people deem important here and now is the same as what people believe the region should work on towards the future. So that's what basically we asked here, or what's presented on this uh, x-axis, is the, let's say, what I call the rank of grand challenges that people see coming uh, towards their region or what, what their region is uh, confronted with. Because that, well, whilst environment, for example, is not stated as very much important for their daily life here and now, it is deemed one of the, well, it's the second biggest challenges that people see coming up for their region in the Netherlands. Um, after basically housing is the, the the only topic that people feel important here and now and also take as a very big challenge for the region uh, in the future to come again perhaps not so much answers rather than questions about how we should think of sustainable regional development. What does it mean? How do we measure it? And what then do our measures imply for how we deal with it in policy making? And this is the only French I could come up with. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> Many, many thanks, uh, Sean. It was uh, very interesting.
and uh, and that there are many questions for uh, such a topic. So, Micheline, if you want to to start. Oui, uh, Uh, you mentioned um, an index, how can I say, an alternative index uh, that to replace GDP. Uh, my question is, what is the difference between the index that you built compared with the one developed by Stan and Stiglitz, uh, Liga AH? And what, what is the difference? Very good question. Um, there's not much of a difference in the sense that we use the same framework, so the 11 dimensions that we uh, that we use are the same as the ones suggested by, let's say, the Stiglitz report, or at least the, uh, the project that followed from that report into the Better Life initiative by the OECD. Um, so the framework is there is the same. The indicators that we have are a bit more detailed. Uh, since that we focus on the Netherlands, we can, well, use more detailed indicators, underlying variables. Because the, from the Better Life initiative, of course, this has to cover all OECD countries and, well, then you have to harmonize across countries, you have to include the same variables across countries, and then typically there are less variables available. But in principle, indeed, the framework and the line of reasoning is very much comparable with the OECD initiative that followed from the, the Stiglitz report. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, it's. It's very interesting. But I think the the questions that you uh, that you raise also at the end are also very relevant, right? So and uh, and 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 maybe not not easy to answer. Um, well, first of all, I think uh, the, uh, uh, going back a bit to the trade issue, right? So uh, um, as you said. Um, if you look at trade uh, trade-offs between only two dimensions within the index, right? So uh, again, uh, going back to environment and income, um, that's uh, and then there is a correlation that might not, uh, of course, uh, uh, show causality between the two. Um, but of course, it's more complex, right? Because you you take many more uh, dimensions in the whole index. So basically, what you would like to have is that you can uh, say. Uh, estimate the marginal effects of one change in one variable, how it affects the other 11 dimensions, right? So, uh, uh, so not only the two dimensions, but uh, 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 to, to, to look at all those effects uh, uh, within the index overall, which of course is, makes it very complicated, uh, right? Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and to do that, uh, probably, I'm not sure uh, whether there's any work on that already, that, that, that take that into account uh, so so uh, but that is ultimately what you want to know because if indeed uh, hey, you go to your research question three uh, what can it mean to policymakers policymakers would like to say okay if I now uh, improve my environment how will it affect all the others uh, hey, so it will not only increase my performance on that particular dimension but now how does it affect the other dimensions mm. Uh, so in the end, I might improve the environment, but the overall index will go down. And and yeah, and on which on which dimensions uh, is that happening within that index? I think that is a very very relevant question, and that is what you would like to know as policymakers. Can we ever come up with a kind of framework that we can actually uh, assess that and 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 make it uh, make it relevant for policymakers in that respect? I know it's a big question. Um, I think it, it, your your question um, links to. I mean, I wasn't there yesterday with the talk by uh, Cesar Hidalgo, but from what I understood this morning, that he was talking about prospective analysis, and um, I feel even if you 
have these marginal benefits uh, spelled out. Basically, and that was my remark about is it deterministic or not. You, 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 don't, you still don't really know whether an improvement in income um, uh, whether it needs to come at a cost of the environment in the future ahead of us. So I think one thing, and I think also Mariana Mazzucato always stresses this, is that we also, well, regional development or economic development at large is not just about the rate, it's not just about you know the speed of development, it's also about the direction of development. So I feel that for policymakers it's also a much more, well, a choice of what would you uh, what should development be about for you? Or what then kind of um, um, how do you call it? Uh, Randvoorwaarden? Preconditions. Preconditions do you impose upon steering income, steering employment? I think that's much more Let's say also the question. Thank you. Um, maybe one last comment, if I may, uh, except if there are other questions in the room. I wanted to, to come back to on the, the issue of uh, uh, the trade off uh, and the, the. Well, I mean, I, I've been um, uh, for uh, more than one year uh, uh, an applied economist in uh, an official. Uh, uh, statistical uh, institute in France, uh, which, which we call uh, um, OFCE, uh, and I was uh, uh, predicting. Uh, I was modeling uh, growth in France and modeling GDP and modeling uh, growth employment and so on. So I'm very used to uh, 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 commenting on the GDP growth on the contributions to GDP growth, and as far as I remember. We knew that there were trade-offs between the di various di dimensions of uh, uh, the contributions to, to GDP growth, and uh, but since this is an ex-post measure, we knew that, for example, you c you could obtain GDP GDP growth by uh, policies uh, um, uh, st uh, steering uh, consumption, trying to raise consumption, but that th this this could have uh, negative externalities on. Uh, investment, for example, because of the 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 the, 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 uh, the growth of interest rates, for example. So it's very keen in, a, in a very Keynesian uh, simple framework. But um, uh, the the exposed the exposed measure of GDP told us always told us, okay, uh, you've been go you've been good at doing this uh, this. The rise in uh, interest rate was not too high, so the result the final result on the GDP was quite uh, important. So for, for me, it, it would be the same here. If you uh, uh, try to uh, stimulate uh, job creation, employment, and revenue, and if you manage to do this with uh, policies that uh, uh, mm, create good jobs, uh, non-polluting non activity, and so on, uh, the negative uh, externalities will be lower on your index, uh, the index of uh, functionings, will rise more than if your policies are to create jobs in uh, uh, polluting industries and things like that. So anyway, even if there are these trade-offs, uh, I think these indicators are very important. And the most important thing is to use them. <laughs> in fact, is that policymakers use them as indicators of the of success of or failure of their policies. And uh, if these policies take into account all the dimensions of the problem, uh, they will take into account the negative externalities of economic activity and probably make it change in a way that uh, these negative externalities are, are, are less are, are, are less important. That's what we, uh, according to me, we can hope from that. Yeah. Well, 
obviously I'm in favor of using such indicators <laughs> uh, still and I didn't get into it uh, into depth a lot, but the previous slides, which I cannot uh, display right now, uh, show something like that we uh, that we should use um, such indicators as debatable debating devices, in the sense that we should not just. I didn't come up with this term myself. Uh, actually, it was a French um, sociologist of science and technology, Rémi Barré. Uh, who came up with it uh, some years ago in the context actually of research excellence discussions. Um, and what he suggested there was not to simply use such indicators at face value, saying, okay, so this goes up, so we have to put money in there, or, or th th this goes down, so we have to put money in there at a cost of some other dimension, that, but use it as a starting point for the policy debate, okay, what's going on actually, also behind these figures. Not that you shouldn't trust these figures, that's not, the, that's not uh, what I'm uh, saying here in saying these are debatable, no, they should, they should much more form a starting point for the policy debate, okay, what's going on actually, also behind these, uh, these numbers. Yeah, um, also um, go maybe back to uh, uh, research question three is, um, okay, all of those 11 dimensions, I, I, I've, okay, again, I think it's great work and especially going into the geography of it, right, uh, which of is, uh, this, this whole beyond GDP uh, our work has not really gone at the subnational scale, so that's already, I think, a big step forward. But it also uh, brings up all kinds of problems, right? So um, the um, the way you measure it at the subnational scale uh, and all the eleven dimensions uh, 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 that you actually measure, uh, maybe most of those are even not uh, controlled uh, by regional policymakers at that at that local level. Right, so uh, uh, you, 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 you might say, okay, those metrics can mean something to regional policy makers, but if all, uh, many of those dimensions are beyond the control of regional policy makers, so yeah, what, what, can, what kind of information, uh, you know, how, how can we make it relevant then to them? Uh, so I, I, I'm struggling a bit with that, seeing uh, what, kind of, what, what the implications would be. Yeah, that's, um, um, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, I, I have to think of, well, I was recently in a discussion with a friend who works at the province of Utrecht, so also where, the, uh, where Utrecht University is located. And basically he's coordinating economic policies across municipalities in the province. And he was in a debate with a municipality that's neighboring the city of Utrecht. And that municipality is quite big. It was like it's the second or third, I think it's the third biggest municipality in the province after Utrecht and Amersfoort. But in terms of employment, it was like the sixth or seventh uh, largest uh, employer in the province. So one of the politicians there argued we have to rise in terms of employment. We have to create more employment opportunities in our municipality because we are third in terms of size, population, but only sixth or seventh or eighth in terms of employment. And then he said, but what's the problem? Everyone that lives here works in Utrecht. Why would you spend money on generating employment in this particular municipality? So, one thing then, I feel that this, such an index, and also when you go deeper into the underlying dimensions shows, is that there are also, you know, interregional relationships, dependency, I, I call this at some point also the 
neighboring uh, uh, region uh, of borrowing from your neighbor, let's say, effect uh, is that you kind of get a feel for these uh, interdependencies and these interrelationships between regions. So as not to steer um, public money, public initiatives only based on one figure like employment in the example that I, uh, that I gave. Um, no, uh, yes, exter externalities play out on, on different spatial scales, right? So, uh, uh, um, so air pollution produced in one region might cause problems in the other regions. Okay, so that also goes beyond the control of of, of policymakers, or at least they have then to collaborate with those that uh, that produce uh, the pollution. But it's also about uh, uh, yeah, what kind of role do policymakers have? What kind of yeah, what kind of policy fields can they actually influence or is that more a matter that that, that uh, happens at the national scale i mean uh, uh, um, work life balance i'm not sure uh, maybe that's more an issue of national policy right so and there might be many other examples of those dimensions that you refer to that are not actually controllable uh, by by regional policymakers. So it's it's also uh, that goes beyond also the fact that externalities play out at different spatial scales. But it's also what can policymakers actually do? What kind of task can they actually perform and influence those kind of dimensions uh, that uh, that uh, citizens care about in their own region? Thank you, thank you, Ron. I'm sorry, we really have to. Up right now because the uh, the people for the next uh, session, the roundtable, uh, just arrived, uh, and they are policymakers. They are very busy, so we will have to start uh, right on time, or uh, if possible. So if there is only two or three minutes for a coffee break. <laughs> it's a, tr a kind of trade-off too. And, uh, and we will start again with this uh, very interesting roundtable on the social policies. Thank you again, Jude. Thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. Les micros, s'il vous plaît, si vous pouvez les réactiver. Merci, super. Euh, très bien. Alors, euh, bonjour. Ok, great. Uh, welcome again and good morning to everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be the moderator for this uh, roundtable. Uh, and we're very happy and very proud to uh, have organized, uh, thanks to Marine Casazel and all the uh, department council, uh, it doesn't happen that often that we can organize uh, really a roundtable to exchange uh, between uh, researchers, uh, citizens, and uh, policymakers, uh, um, actors who uh, work on uh, really on the field of public policies. So here it is a great opportunity, and it's really the main objective of this Bernard Maris chair to organize this kind of exchange, uh, to have a platform to exchange views. We are, there is a, a simultaneous interpreting service and we also uh, uh, broadcast on uh, YouTube, uh, Bernard, uh, uh, Bernard Marie's uh, YouTube uh, chain. So uh, please put your mics uh, uh, really, uh, really uh, use your mics uh, efficiently so that people can hear you. So I'm going to introduce uh, different um, speakers of this roundtable who made us uh, the great pleasure, gave us the great pleasure to come and present their actions and reflections. 
and their policies, maybe the issues, the issues they are facing in their actions. We're going to have the pleasure to have Arnaud Simillon, who is the vice president of uh, social action of uh, neighborhood uh, of the House of Solidarities in, and insertion of the uh, Department Conseil of 31 of uh, uh, Haute Garonne, uh, Siam El Boukli, who is a uh, uh, director of uh, development and coordination uh, for social affairs at the, again, the consul uh, department, and Timothée Buverger, who is an uh, uh, academic uh, university teacher uh, affiliated to uh, political science, Sciences Po in Bordeaux, and co director of the experimentation observatory of local innovation for the uh, Jean Jaurès Foundation. So they're going to give us an idea of uh, how policies are led and implemented in Haute-Garonne. And Timothy will give us his idea as a researcher and a hindsight with uh, the uh, different experiments that have been carried out here. And Siam will tell us more about uh, this will to uh, try uh, on the uh, uh, the uh, income minimum income here in Haute Garonne, and uh, Mr. Simeon, you have the floor. Arnaud Simeon, thanks again to uh, for the for organizing this roundtable. Thanks, uh, um, and I uh, really uh, I say thank you, and uh, I'm going to be very. Uh, synthetic and quick uh, to summarize the ideas uh, political speech we're coming out from a period that uh, has just confirmed things that we knew already a major democratic crisis a crisis of citizenship and a period of uh, uh, rejection and uh, uh, not uh, trusting uh, political uh, and elected representatives and all the elitist uh, world of uh, the country. It has been reinforced by the health crisis that uh, led to uh, losing ideas and common sense and uh, really of uh, people uh, becoming even more individualist and living uh, by themselves, uh, um, closing themselves to the world. And uh, we uh, could see, uh, having said that, that through collectivities, many actions were carried out, very positive actions. How, how do you do as a, an elected representative in Haute Garonne? How do you do? Uh, to work when you are uh, you are implementing public policies, and when I am in uh, direct connection with uh, citizens, I'm also uh, elected of uh, a city uh, of uh, Colomiers, which is a 40,001 inhabitants small city near Toulouse, and it's part of the Haute Garonne county. So we are need to be very humble here because the period. It's very difficult. We need to be exemplary in our, our political practices and we we'll try to implement policies in a different way, in a different uh, manner. I was talking uh, about that earlier on for the triple alliance that allows us to put diagnostic, give uh, proposed solutions and find solutions and try to find the functioning of the project, the best functioning to assess the project. To, it's not just the uh, aim in, in, in uh, per se, but it is part of it if we want to move things and change things. This triple alliance, as I was saying, is made out of uh, citizens, associations, uh, all the uh, people around the territory and that are uh, working in the Haute Garonne County in uh, a citizen uh, dialogue that allows to validate or not to validate the decisions that sometimes we want to uh, carry out. Uh, so this triple alliance, the elected representatives and the uh, departmental council are participating. Uh, 
uh, they elected thanks to their uh, political impulsion, the administration, because they legally um, uh, secure the processes and apply our public policies. And then there is you, and this is what we did within Haute Garonne. There is research university, research labs, which are also involved in our public policies, and they can validate or invalidate our processes. Uh, we can gather your proposals and we can implement them. It's uh, the example of the minimum income, for example, and other projects that we are representing where university and presence, presence of university in our public policies building has been fundamental. This triple alliance is uh, very virtuous and it carries out a lot of hope because uh, for culture, citizens uh, in questions that are very, very complex, this is what we try to represent in a very humble manner at the county level, at the Département of Haute-Garonne, of Toulouse. Maybe you know Haute-Garonne, uh, other people don't. It is a very nice county that is very diversified geographically, have very rural, mountainous uh, areas, urban, peri-urban areas. You know Toulouse very well. It is a very young Department, uh, between 11 and 34 years, it's uh, the average of one inhabitants on four, uh, very young uh, inhabitants, very young population. The skills, the competencies of uh, the uh, uh, county council, uh, thanks to this, uh, uh, they uh, implement uh, uh, policies uh, that have to do with human solidarities, uh, this is where we work on uh, um, houses, uh, Maison Départementale de Solidarité, solidarity uh, institutions. We have many disciplines, 1,800 professionals from uh, really uh, from a uh, uh, young age prevention, pre uh, uh, prenatal prevention, uh, protection of uh, uh, the uh, teenagers and children. PAPH uh, for the elderly and uh, for disabled people. And all these public policies are built with uh, what we call the AAS, the individual help of, for solidarity that are given, so the subsidies uh, given to uh, the, also for the minimum income RSA or PCH for disabled people. So human solidarities, territorial uh, solidarities, as I was saying, Haute Garonne is very diversified and the county council has decided to help uh, cities, town and cities to renovate the uh, public, uh, uh, public communities and that they need to redistribute uh, the budget to help uh, town, uh, cities, and villages of Haute-Garonne. A small focus on the, the health crisis, as you know, the emerging uh, emergence of uh, new publics, uh, new people, uh, people who work in flex contracts. Uh, uh, young people have been uh, very hardly hit by the crisis and getting poorer and more precarious. We have an emergency plan of 170 million euros that allowed uh, to help uh, citizens in difficulties they had to actually be feed themselves um, between uh, they gave they had up to 300 euros uh, uh, bonds that helped them to buy uh, food and uh, hygiene uh, uh, items and also help for psychological help and for the elderly too, it is uh, uh, the skills, competencies of uh, the county council and also helping in, uh, the uh, associations uh, that uh, were really a pillar to uh, support uh, the most uh, fragile of our inhabitants. Then we have also social policies. Uh, this afternoon in this triple alliance I was telling you about, uh, public policies uh, uh, are being uh, imagined with citizens, uh, local representatives, local uh, elected representatives. We have really finally studied 
this, the, uh, the county plan, plan departemental for youngsters, that uh, where university uh, research helped us uh, tremendously. And this is the uh, young uh, reflex to say we need to think uh, for the county delegation and uh, county directorships to think about uh, youth, not just one project, uh, one process. They all need to be thought and built thinking about uh, the youngsters. And so it is a cross uh, of a policy, CGO31, which is a, a digital platform that uh, helped us and helped youngsters during uh, lockdown and the health crisis. And lots of um, all the stakeholders for the young people can have access to this platform. And uh, we uh, worked with Véronique Borde, who is uh, a uh, academic uh, for, uh, from the Jean Jaurès University. Also, uh, social mixity in um, schools, sixth form schools. This is uh, an approach uh, that was um, carried out with uh, the university. Let's not reproduce at school the inequali social inequalities that we can see in life. A school where youngsters of all different uh, social backgrounds, if they don't meet, it creates uh, a very fragile society that is broken, where you can't recognize yourself. It is a fundamental point. We uh, uh, work with uh, six form colleges in uh, Saint-Simon. It's also the uh, path for the uh, citizens' uh, uh, path to promote uh, laicity and uh, the um, uh, to actually pr promote uh, uh, this uh, citizen's conscious, consciousness that comes out of the uh, first years of uh, at school uh, with many investments with the association well to help. It's also the uh, help uh, towards uh, helping people being uh, not being left out from a digitalization of the world with the creation of ho uh, uh, houses uh, that allow youngsters and, uh, sorry, uh, citizens have difficult to, difficulties with this digital world to be able to have a solution uh, very near their homes and they can be helped. And, and then, of course, the uh, income, uh, which is an income to integrate. It is a Republican uh, uh, really uh, uh, access. Uh, it is an approach of autonomy, of uh, emancipation. It is a positive collective project, scientific project. I want to uh, help uh, and uh, thank François Sicot from Jean Jaurès University who helped us with this. You uh, spoke about uh, this question. It was a question we had uh, for this uh, income, for this uh, minimum income. There is a new uh, National Assembly that has just been freshly elected. And uh, we have uh, left uh, uh, a member of parliament that uh, we'll be able to propose this uh, experimentation. Tomorrow it is uh, the project of uh, uh, no zero um, non-recourse. 30 percent of uh, uh, French uh, people are victim of this uh, non-recourse. All these projects have two points in, com in common. First of all, we shouldn't be fatalist and say, OK, it's like that. There's nothing we can do about it, like uh, Leon Blum said. But also this triple alliance I was talking about earlier. If we have this uh, citizens' dialogue, this association work, the uh, collectivity administration and uh, elected representatives, research and university, university, all work together. We need you, Iket Nunc. We don't. We can't afford to lose more time to think of public policies differently when the challenges are just so huge ahead of us. And because 
this beautiful triptych of um, uh, liberty, equality, fraternity doesn't really make sense in uh, some people's everyday life. This is what I wanted to say. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this very stimulating, uh, passionate introduction. Timothée Duverger, who is going to go uh, really beyond this uh, minimum uh, income uh, idea. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here with you with my Haute Garonne friends. Because uh, on the um, minimum income, I have my idea is different because it is the result of uh, observing participation. That's to say, how can I be an acting uh, representative and researcher because I was at the um, uh, uh, office for the uh, Gironde uh, in Bordeaux uh, office and with Marine Lazelle, we were working on research. To tell you about this and of this uh, project, I think it's a subject that will be really pregnant again, uh, very important again. Uh, the COVID crisis really has brought forward a new, a new type of population. Is it a new population or amplification of poverty phenomena uh, that uh, touched uh, many people already? But there's an amplification, of course, a factor uh, uh, for youngsters. So here, uh, for the youngest population, so here, we have also the uh, economic uh, crisis with the, the inflation issues and uh, also the question of uh, being able to uh, for the uh, the systems that is uh, the food and everything is getting more and more expensive so all this is going to be really at the heart of uh, the uh, policies we can see how but it, it will be really something topical. For this minimum income, the idea uh, rose in 2016. It was uh, really uh, the Gironde uh, who uh, spoke about it. And then it was, uh, uh, it was uh, 18 can councils. It's, it was more a left uh, reflection. Uh, we started saying that uh, the RSA, which is a, a help, it was really uh, the uh, fact that uh, this uh, social policy, uh, which was a neoliberal reference rule that changed the uh, RMI with the RSA, we wanted to come from a welfare logic to a workfare logic. And this is what uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, accentuated with his uh, uh, universal activity uh, income. So there was a reflection on these uh, activation policies. There is a non-recourse that is very important because the first 30% uh, of people who don't uh, use uh, this help, uh, they could have... Uh, 30% uh, of people do not use it. Even if it's 20%, 30% is from time to time for these uh, benefits. Uh, so we are, uh, it is really a failure. We're creating uh, rights and people do not have access to them. That's a real issue. Second issue is uh, going back to work. So does uh, the RSA, this benefit, does it help? Uh, to go back to work uh, in a better way, uh, does it make it easier? We can see it. Uh, we can see this research in Finland too. It is a strong element. Variations are very weak. It uh, can be uh, a uh, boost uh, with uh, different actions, uh, but it really touches a very very small percentage of population because it, a question of access is not just a question of. Uh, uh, personal will. I mean, do I have uh, access to employment? At the moment, uh, there's a problem of recruiting people. But uh, people are very far from uh, employment. There's a problem of health, uh, mobility. You all know that in Haute-Garonne, uh, this council looks like Gironde. So 
I can see how it works in Gironde, so it could be a problem for you, this mobility. And then a problem uh, for, to have your children uh, being kept whilst you're at work, etc. So all these uh, elements, all those elements make it difficult for people to go back to work. So this issue of uh, activation policy, it's, it's actually a relative failure. There's a consensus on this. Jean-Claude Barbier work shows it. Uh, and many other researchers, Nicolas Duvou, I was talking about uh, that uh, with him a few weeks ago. So many people uh, really are saying the same thing. So uh, this failure of the RSA, there's a second dimension, having said that, we're analyzing public policies. The other dimension was utopia. Okay, we have these ideas of uh, um, basic revenue, uh, minimum uh, universal revenue. It's from 2016, we started talking about it. We report the Percheron report at the Senate uh, with a think tank uh, also uh, in Jean Jaurès Foundation uh, with a note came out in 2016 then Benoît Hamon really had this intuition to carry uh, carry out and he uh, got the uh, socialist uh, he won the primary even if it was uh, acted against him for the presidential election but there is really a ramping up of this uh, topic and the Canteen Council started thinking about it with a clinical analysis of uh, uh, a uh, tool for uh, public action of RSA, this uh, benefit, and then you, the utopic uh, uh, dimension that puts uh, citizens' energy in the project. Many works were uh, actually um, implemented. And it was a, a, an approach that was implemented in a very collective, uh, in a partnership, a uh, very strong partnership between uh, uh, councils. You insisted on uh, innovation, uh, and then uh, you can say it's uh, used. It's not really uh, fashionable. Uh, regions and metropoles should be really uh, focused on. and. Uh, Finally, there's a real topic here, a real issue, and uh, councils want to show that they, can, they could be innovating, more innovating than the state itself. So it was also a challenge. Then they started working with uh, citizens on different things in Gironde region, uh, Bordeaux area. There is a, a, uh, an, in, uh, an inquest carried out in all the councils around, and then they all applied different participation uh, ways to try to uh, give light to the project, to uh, have a captation of very weak signals, and uh, political decisions were not taken, taking, taken sorry, upstream. So uh, the uh, project was built as they went along with researchers, with the citizens. We're working with the uh, Institute of Public Policies, who is uh, with the FCE, is uh, one of the two pillars, organism working on assessing uh, uh, economically public policies. Antoine Bozio is really ahead of this with Daniel Cohen, too who's a very known economist uh, working there in this operation, and uh, Supremap, who's a lab linked to the uh, uh, planification um, uh, commissary. So the work was carried out with arbitrary options. So presidents of uh, the, uh, the county councils were meeting and were discussing uh, how could we transform the RSA benefit in a minimum income? So the IPP reflection and the different inquest, uh, citizens' inquest, came to feed uh, and to uh, uh, agree uh, on the to uh, make the uh, debate uh, to feed the debate, and then we decided that we have to be careful. If you put everything in everywhere, you actually increase poverty because each benefit answers a, a specific need. Uh, so they're often very expensive and it generated uh, negative effects and actually increasing of poverty. So we needed to uh, change into a uh, merging of uh, uh, this minimum income and we needed to come, come out with this. And that was 
so it was uh, the merging of the uh, two benefits. And we shouldn't uh, merge the uh, uh, benefit for disabling with a minimum for the elderly, a minimum benefit for the elderly. Then we needed to add young people. At what age? You had different options uh, according to different uh, councils. Uh, for the Haute Garonne, it was as 18. Other uh, uh, councils thought that uh, maybe it was a, a different age. So the expectations from the population was very high. It was 18 for uh, young people. Then uh, do we suppress sanctions uh, if a person refuses to uh, have a uh, to uh, accept the uh, job offers, do we reduce uh, he or his or her alloc uh, benefit? So it is also uh, an issue politically. This is what we do with RSA. We actually reduce the benefit. Yes, yeah, some people here uh, they are not French and they don't know what RSA means. Because also you need to explain, I'm talking about our foreign colleagues and Dutch colleagues, uh, RSA, what is it, a benefit? RSA, it is a minimal income that is given without any condition of uh, uh, activities. You don't need to pay anything. You, uh, it is a bottom uh, income uh, from 25 years old. We don't. Uh, we, there is nothing for the youngest. Uh, if you, uh, if you, uh, we think that uh, if you're beyond 25, it's more family benefits. Um, but uh, the rate of uh, poverty from 18 to 25, it's 25 percent of uh, poverty rate, and it's 14 percent in general population because uh, there is nothing for the uh, young between 18 and 25 uh, because the policymakers think that it comes from the family and he, it's uh, really down to the uh, to the young because we think that they are not responsible they're going to spend the money in uh, playstation or on video, video games so i say these two they are a representation and uh, the approach is also for Latin countries that are different. There's a cultural issue too. And so this benefit is given, the RSA, to all people, any people, any person, sorry, who uh, needs to be a French resident and who, uh, who hasn't got any other income from, uh, from 25 years old. Then the uh, activity bonus is for people already have a revenue. It's uh, a bonus that comes and completes your uh, salary. You are a poor worker, so that it's a complementary uh, income, so, so that you have a continuity bet between very poor people and uh, precarious people. So with this uh, debating point, also with a debate on the question of uh, also women, because uh, the RSA, if two people are working, the only uh, can uh, have 1.5 because uh, social, uh, co co it's a way of, uh, of course, uh, saving money. And uh, that was also a debating point. Uh, it wasn't dealt with uh, because we thought that uh, the uh, young people's issues uh, uh, were more urgent. But many councils also spoke about uh, this issue. Also, the, uh, there is no sanctions. When you uh, benefit from the RSA, you uh, have to look for a job. You need to get into an assertion path uh, to do a training. You have different obligations with the uh, RSA, but you uh, have these obligations, not just your rights, and if you don't do them, you have sanctions that can go up to uh, the cancelling of your benefit. So uh, it's going to cost a lot more money. Uh, it's not very coherent, but it is linked to this uh, guilt, uh, guilty issue of uh, Gideo Christian, uh, Christian uh, 
cultural uh, assumptions. So we were really on uh, talking about this, and the inquest allowed us to show that uh, the fact that it was unconditional, we could experiment it. So we could really have a experimental uh, project because politically it was difficult to accept it, but we could have an exper experiment. And some councils did it. Some councils uh, could ha uh, call it unconditional income. We should call it uh, unconditional income. Mathieu Klein, who is uh, uh, head of the uh, uh, council of um, County of Meurthe and Moselle and is the mayor of Nancy now. So we're talking about this, and some arbitrary points were proposed. From then, a model was uh, built, validated by the, all the uh, uh, presidents, all the chairs of the councils, head of the uh, councils, and uh, um, all the um, <coughs> problems were dealt with. And then behind, there is a model and a proposal, a legal proposal. The anecdote is that this legal model was uh, written by Manuel Vaus, uh, who was a first mi prime minister at the time, and was given to the uh, Canton Council and uh, with the condition of not getting it out during the 2017 presidential elections. So it came out uh, one year later, it was a little bit uh, revamped, and uh, then it was uh, relayed by the uh, uh, parliamentary group. Uh, in, at the time it was the socialist group, and they were the relay, and they, um, and, and, and they presented a bill. And Emmanuel Macron reacted, saying two things. Uh, firstly, uh, when they announced the poverty plan, because he announced this uh, when all of that was uh, put forward, and he announced the poverty plan in which he added a project for RSA two days before the poverty plan. It had never been discussed, discussed or worked, but two days before they met at the Elysee and said, oh, la, 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 what's happening? Um, uh, and they changed the referential of the public policies because here we're out of the neoliberal uh, referential based on efficiency with the idea of getting people back to work. But this is a referential for well-being and uh, uh, more satisfactory uh, conditions, living conditions. So there was, they totally changed the public policies referential, the idea of inconditionality and opening up to, to, to the younger generation. And so uh, we had autonomy, participation, and all of that. So we totally changed the public referential. So uh, the government is being attacked, uh, say it's being attacked, and uh, Edouard Macron said we're going to have a, a universal income for activity. And basically, uh, he uh, makes this announcement during a press conference that number of uh, department uh, uh, chairs uh, fell off their chair and uh, he said we're gonna experience we can experience and this is why the bill was uh, presented and so that number of uh, department uh, chairs arrive and they do this experience and there was a big big debate here with two um, stumbling points and this was uh, in the midst of the uh, gilet jaune period the yellow vest uh, period, you know, with violence and the government that was wondering whether or not they weren't going to dissolve the uh, uh, parliament. And so this discussion arrives in parliament and there are two uh, um, stumbling points, this uh, inconditionality, left, right. The, the, the cost wasn't so much a problem. It was about 20 billion euros was the cost. And uh, they they had made a, a very rough uh, calculation. It could have been a little bit less, but it was basically 20 billion. So 20 billion, I mean, uh, is uh, is sustainable, but but it's not peanuts either. And so people thought they would be attacked uh, on that. But no, the, the problem was inconditionality. So, well, I mean, they're just going to be giving uh, money to people. They're not going to do anything. And imagine the, the, the young, uh, I mean, there was really, we had this discussion that, that took place. You can look at the uh, minutes of the National Assembly, um, Parliament, French Parliament. And so they closed the experience when they, they were open on this first point. Second point, very clearly, uh, the fact that we're in a, because... Uh, the uh, uh, generality uh, 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 general culture, uh, because it's a very general model, and uh, the state is very defined vis-à-vis -vis civil society, but also vis-à-vis -vis the territories. 
And so uh, in France, I have a colleague from uh, Sciences Po Bordeaux who's been writing a book on uh, the territorial policies. And in France, we're very imperfect here. And therefore, there was a second stumbling point, which was that this uh, uh, experience um, project comes from the department. This is uh, uh, not quite what our constitution wants, because our constitutions want something really top to bottom. There's a so-called right uh, for... Um, uh, exper- uh, experimenting, but it, it, it should all come from the state. And, and the fact that it comes from the departments relayed by the General National Assembly, also our parliament, is uh, totally the opposite of our uh, uh, traditional political model. So that uh, played a lot. And the conjunction of these two uh, models led to the uh, rejection uh, by the president. So there was a negative vote. Uh, I'll skip the detail of the vote. I could uh, mention this, but uh, but I, I think I've got another two minutes to go. So uh, to conclude, uh, the the president didn't uh, put forward the uh, uh, the revenue universel, so this universal income, because he wanted to merge all the allocations, uh, because uh, millions uh, w- were going to lose, and so this report. Uh, uh, came up and um, uh, and the the information came out. Millions of people were losing, and so he couldn't implement this. So for t- tomorrow, and, uh, and the current discussion is. So we've got two questions today, I believe. The first is in line with uh, my question, uh, which is how can we reform our social uh, minimums and. Uh, link this to the tax issue. Here we have a a question. Uh, Could we do a social uh, tax reform with a continuum on payments uh, in uh, inbound and outbound? And maybe we can adjust the tax system on the one hand and the social system on the other hand because the two ministries don't talk to each other. But there's a second issue here. And behind, what referential? Because... uh, uh, is it a neoliberal referential where we focus to getting back uh, people back to work or reinforcing activation policies, or do we more have a referential that I call, uh, you know, territorial well-being? So basically, this idea that we're going to build communities and uh, we're going to try and help uh, uh, communities, um, you know, develop and expand. But so we have this double social and tax reform, and second level. Do we want to carry on defending? Because basically we think uh, we, we need to, to go through experimentation for this. Or do we want a generalization? This is an issue. And is uh, experimentation on the allocation side of things, so basically this uh, reform, or is it on the uh, support? Uh, couldn't we offer the different territories to experience new uh, uh, support modes to increase uh, people's uh, um, uh, power in order to uh, avoid, uh, you know, guilt uh, for individuals in uh, this uh, homo economicus paradigm where we activate uh, people in uh, on, on the different interests. Uh, all the sociological research uh, proves that this doesn't work. So there's a second topic here, in my opinion. So I, I'm done, and uh, I would like to give the floor. Well, thank you very much, and congratulations, because this was extremely interesting, uh, a beautiful summary. Uh, I'm not going to say more, and we'll give the floor to Siam, who will be uh, uh, more concrete on how uh, uh, this uh, operated in Old Garon. So, yes, I'll do uh, be uh, presenting the link. Uh, following this work in 2016 and the National Impulse, uh, we had this desire last year within the uh, um, Haute-Garonne department. The president and its, uh, his majority wanted to relaunch uh, the work locally on this uh, uh, experimenting uh, basic income for the younger generation. So there is this social need and demand after the uh, the credit uh, the, the um, COVID crisis is a request. And on the field, uh, professionals are supporting over 30,000 households and we have structural evolutions in this need and this request before the crisis, uh, especially as regards to how people express their needs. Why do they come for very punctual needs? They know the social system very well and they come with very precise issues. And so they do not necessarily adhere to a traditional social support on the, over the long term. And then we also see needs evolution, which are the result of the crisis. You've mentioned them very briefly. Uh, switching to precariousness for new categories 
of public that we did not know, other publics that were already uh, receiving, uh, you know, social uh, support but had problems of isolation and, and health which were had a very negative impact on their health. And uh, I, I must say, in terms of traffic, uh, you know, non-declared uh, economics, this uh, also put a certain number of people in, uh, in uh, and whole families in difficulties. Then uh, the question of uh, young people who had to stay at home with parents with uh, problems of addiction were very concrete on a daily basis. And children with, uh, you know, the closing of school canteen, this is very concrete. But just to show how this crisis impacted the population in, the, in its daily life and this uh, forced us this forces us to think uh, public policies differently now and we need a more global approach for the need of the person and their life journey because uh, when people come to us when they come to the institutions they have more and more accumulative problems and therefore today we cannot uh, solve differently separately uh, violence health housing and income uh, and we can see that uh, these are all the same, um, uh, you know, facet of one same uh, situation. And therefore, uh, you know, the crisis was, uh, was terrible, a lot of absenteeism, for instance. And, and for social workers, you know the difficulty of uh, social uh, and medical social uh, professionals, but... It, there was a true opportunity here because this enabled us to think new modes, new approaches for public policy, just to uh, set things upside down, and uh, and we had a di and have a different uh, understanding of poverty. What you know, what should poor people to do uh, do to solve their problems? You know, um, and. Uh, the deserving and the undeserving poor, a very 19th century vision of things. And, and this crisis that we all weathered on a global scale enabled us to understand that you could, uh, you know, switch to uh, a poverty even if you weren't um, destined for this. And um, it is very political. And therefore, we have to change the way uh, we deal with um poverty fighting or poverty medicating uh, policies and there is a true opportunity because this basic income is a wonderful opportunity to carry on thinking about these uh, um, solutions and here scientists and uh, uh, researchers are, are, are essential and their role is essential and I'd like to tell you how we, we considered this and how we experienced this uh, basic income in Haute-Garonne and I like to, because we worked with scientists and we tried to see what they could provide. Now, we are quite used, to, you know, to work, you know, between politics and uh, the administration. And, and, and this system works fairly well. And the point of research is to help us sometimes uh, um, put a little bit of uh, flesh on, on the uh, bones of, uh, uh, you know, uh, action. And uh, uh, the first report of uh, politics was uh, the International Review. I mean, we're used to this. We have our public policies, we have a diagnosis, and we do, uh, I don't know, benchmarking, and we try and see what others do. And scientists, uh, they look at an international level what, uh, what, what's done and um, in terms of policies and uh, fight against poverty, many initiatives in Canada, Denmark, third world countries, um, what does the attribution of an income um, do on uh, reducing poverty? There were many uh, discussions with uh, scientists on, on the terms and we discussed there was, you know, basic uh, uh, income, universal income, existence income. We need to clarify these terms, but they do not encompass the same reality and they are extremely political. And you may have the feeling that all this is something which goes along the same lines. No, the philosophical uh, foundation is not the same and we do not have the same approach. And beyond uh, terms, we had uh, very political discussions on the question of uh, universalism. Um, we experienced something in Haute Garonne. Is it for everyone or not? In uh, in a context of you know exit of the uh, uh, so, uh, um, uh, COVID crisis, uh, left wing um, politics. Are we going to allocate the same sum to everyone, independent from their personal situation? This is not neutral, politically speaking, and there were many discussions. Then there's a question of um, parents' income. We had very, uh, you know, a French model, you know, uh, what do uh, young people hang on to, what their family, and should we take into consideration uh, the family situation? 
then there's the counterparties. Uh, it's the same today with the contrat d'engagement jeune. What do we ask young people to do uh, as a counterparty for this income? So there is um, citizen commitment. Can citizen commitment be a counterparty to something? There are many, many discussions with scientists. And eventually we uh, moved on to uh, unconditionality. And so these are discussions with, uh, which are not neutral and it was important to have a political life and to put uh, policies in a different framework, uh, something else than just managing the financial resource which is getting uh, more, more and more scarce. And so uh, a true uh, input of the scientific community for this work on top of uh, mobilizing our group, Miroir Jeanne, you said it, Monsieur Signon, we have a fairly long tradition of participation of people involved in, uh, you know, making decisions. And this group, Miroir Jeanne, was also um, uh, put to contribution. And so uh, the young mentioned fraud, family income, and we really weren't expecting this. And it's very interesting because... Uh, I mean, they were only representing themselves, but but it was uh, quite uh, quite an interesting input, and it was very precious input, and this uh, led us to remain very humble and modest in the forecast uh, and um, uh, of uh, you know the different. Um but that we also discussed the, the method, and so we are experiencing in Haute Garonne, and so we have a test group uh, or control group. Uh, shall we do a random selection, but on what ba basis, you know, uh, the social security list, well, we can't access any other list because uh, of the GDPR. And then, of course, the, we have uh, representation issues because we don't want to leave aside invisible publics. We need to go and reach out to them. The size of the sample, uh, starting from how many do we consider that scientifically the result uh, is valuable? And we started uh, working with two groups of 1,000 people. And uh, this led us to uh, an imperfect object, this project of experience, which is not perfect for everyone because it was uh, the, the meeting point of different rationalities. And this is where it becomes interesting because politically we accepted, I mean, we maintained, uh, uh, you know, uh, different uh, layers with, with uh, two uh, differences depending on uh, income. For scientists, I mean, this is imperfect, uh, and you're certainly scientists, and of course, uh, random selection, uh, the question of individual uh, invisible populations is, you know, far from neutral. And for us, from an ad admin uh, point of view, it was a real challenge. Uh, protection of personal data, there's also the question of other, uh, you know, uh, social benefits. This is not a national experience, although, um, I mean, the, the idea is national. And so in Haute Garonne, this is an experience, and this is done independently from the other, uh, you know, uh, social benefits that they may get, um, like scholarships or others, and we see what it changes. And then, of course, there's a financial challenge, and I have to talk about this because these are sums mm -hmm. that uh, are, are, are quite important. Nine million euros have been planned by the Conseil Départemental for this project. And um, so uh, an imperfect object, which was the meeting point of different rationalities, political, scientific and administrative, and an assessment that would have been very rich because the idea was to use this uh, basic income for 18 months and assess its impact on social and professional insertion, on access to housing, on health care and subjective well-being, and we know how these elements are extremely important today, on the relationship of these young people with their parents and friends, but also on their relations, uh, relationship with institutions and their positioning as a citizen. And the political bet was to say that this basic income is a tool for emancipation, mm -hmm but also a way to bring people back to the Republic, uh, people who feel excluded from national solidarity. We do not have any law on experimenting at this point. Maybe we will at some days. So this experience did not uh, uh, 
end with a conclusion, but we hope this is will be uh, another break uh, to uh, uh, to this uh, uh, experience general uh, situation. Uh, two uh, words about other projects that you may be interested in. We worked around uh, a territory. Uh, and uh, we had announcements on uh, automation of, uh, you know, support with, uh, along the logic of, you know, this national poverty policy. And so today there's an acknowledgement of uh, creativity in order to, to move on faster, although there is this defiance that you mentioned and the challenge for us for two categories of public, farmers and uh, plus 50 years old. The idea is to see how with these people and uh, institutions, uh, professionals who support them, how can we imagine uh, different modalities to cross-cut information, to go towards these people in a more specific way and in order to avoid uh, these people facing difficulties when they uh, request um, uh, social supports that um, they deserve. And so... Uh, uh, of course, we need to see what are the uh, small concrete things that we can do. And uh, here we are clearly, uh, we work along the lines of what we did during uh, the uh, um, COVID crisis. Uh, and uh, we must be very creative if we want to move forward. And there's another project that I believe is very interesting that we could discuss today. Um, these new offers that we develop for, for people who benefit uh, from the RSA, you've mentioned it, you know, activating expenditures. I mean, uh, access to employment, does it only depend on the desire of the person? And so we are developing new offers for these beneficiaries. And this year we've started call for projects for the beneficiaries of the RSA whose health is the main hurdle to insertion. We are not developing extra health care solutions, but we are trying to bridge the link between uh, health care. You know, I've got a cancer, so I don't imagine work. Uh, I have, I don't know, some uh, kind of behavioral um, disorder, and therefore I don't imagine working, or I've got problem with teeth, and therefore I have a problem of uh, self-esteem. And uh, and then we have uh, beneficiaries uh who've been for over three years uh, benefiting from these social benefits. And we know that even a few hours a week is a lot for them. And so we need uh, to recreate pleasure in, in social links. Uh, and this is a way of uh, coming out of two years of isolation for these insertion programs. And then there's a last offer on uh, acquiring the uh, codes, uh, you know, for companies, but all, for also for all the institutional approaches. And therefore, we have professionals that this would meet a true need for the population uh, in order to be able, and we should be able to assess this uh, early 2023 and see if we maintain this. Thank you very much, Siam El Bukini. Uh, Bukili. This was uh, extremely interesting, and um, many thanks to one and all. Uh, this was extremely interesting, and uh, it was uh, it's quite an achievement to be able to present in such a short period of time such a complex situation. And I believe that you've uh, totally understood the challenges. There's the technical side of thing. There's the political side of thing, of course, and. Um, there are many, many obstacles and hurdles uh, on the way to uh, these uh, projects. Now, uh, thank you very much for, um, you know, respecting uh, time allocated and uh, because this means that we are going to have time for questions and this is extremely precious. And I believe that my colleagues are very eager to put you to the question and uh, to start the discussion. Maybe I, I could tell you why, in my opinion, it is extremely stimulating for a social science researcher to listen to you, because we realize that, uh, well, you're, you've got the same questions as we have, well, probably because you've worked with scientists, and, and, and I believe uh, um, that may be one of the answers, but I believe that there are two or three topics that are essential for a social protection, you know, the referential, we need uh, a common referential and uh, we could have an epistemological uh, uh, paradigm and, uh, and referential. And of course, uh, today in the economic sciences, we have uh, less uh, um, a transition uh, 
uh, rather than uh, of old paradigms that are being questioned. You mentioned also the issue of conditionality, uh, the question of uh, incentivizing, which is uh, essential in, in economics. And then there's the assumption also of uh, the um, you know opportunities from economic players who uh, are trying to make the most of all the opportunities in a very selfish manner and to try and uh, bypass the system uh, or use the system in their own interest and so this uh, uh, social paradigm is is uh, broadly questioned i must say and the results uh, uh, of um, behavioral economics uh, uh, tend to uh, uh, go um, to, 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 to air that view and um, then there's um, politics, economics, what is the right scale? Uh, I, I believe that uh, specialists in regional economy who are attending this session are certainly uh, asking themselves this question and constantly what is the right level to assess the efficiency of a policy and to implement it and then of course we have the question of causalities, you know, what is the right way to measure impact of uh, implemented policies. So we are really at the heart of a certain number of very important questions for us and it is extremely refreshing to see how in concrete terms uh, this work can be uh, orchestrated. Um, now, without any further ado, I, I, I do have a few more questions but I'm going to keep them for myself and I can see uh, uh, fingers in the room and therefore uh, uh, there's a microphone over there, uh, please. Uh, yes, I, 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 in fact, I've got loads of questions, but I, I'll try and stick to one. Um, maybe a comment first. For me, this uh, basic or universal income, it, it seems to illustrate what uh, Amount Yasen talks about when he refers to resources and uh, capabilities basically basic income arrives as a conversion factor which will enable people to choose the life they want to live uh, and that's the first uh, comment second comment uh, time time that uh, you you need for this assessment this experience 11, 18 months is a short period of time. It's short considering that if I uh, consider in terms of assessment, I mean, after a training, uh, it's the minimum that um, we are going to consider because uh, we know that uh, insertion is a lengthy process. And therefore, 80 months only... Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that the results take into consideration all the elements uh, uh, and everything this may generate in the change of a life. Uh, and, and then maybe we could... Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure that limiting this... I mean, I'm not sure that behind... Uh, psychologically speaking, uh, I mean, aren't people going to say, well, you know, in 18 months I'm back to square one? So, yes, this is, uh, yeah, that's what I want to say. Oui, ça me donne l'occasion de préciser, je ne l'ai pas dit, l'expérimentation. Yes, the experimentation um, uh, starts, uh, lasts for 18 months, but the assessment of uh, past life goes uh, well beyond the allocation of the benefit. So you can see also the balances we need to reach when you want to make it concrete uh, with a cri uh, financial criteria too. And also uh, the uh, following up on work if a, a young person starts at uh, 23, 24 years old, then he will uh, then be 25. There was uh, the issue of transition to other types of benefits. But it is a local experiment and uh, w those reflections uh, have a point only if there is a natural impulse and uh, we give uh, really flesh and blood to all these uh, uh, political um, proposals. 
I would like to add a few things on cap capabilities. You're right, it was conceived as such. It was designed to give a resource. But having said that, in the experiment, we didn't deal with it because of uh, the duration of uh, the benefits and uh, the the uh, if it's randomized, uh, you have um, issues arising from this. Now you have Nobel prizes uh, given to this. There are many subjects are being touched upon. So it was a design of this, but then there is uh, the idea of the amount. The idea was not to uh, have a variable of the amount because uh, we had to deal with too many variables. You want to assess behavioral reactions to a uh, uh, political uh, benefit, um, national benefit. There is no uh, the amount. 500 euros is not enough, of course. Everyone thinks it's uh, really. Uh, uh, everyone thinks it's not enough. You need to uh, increase this. So there, there is this issue. If you want to have the right uh, arbitration of uh, chosen benefits, then uh, this poverty um, issue is uh, really the constraints uh, is very, are very high. What is the uh, uh, yeah, there's really an issue uh, according to um, the amount. And then the duration of experimentation, the IPP uh, said that it should last for, for two to three years. Having said that, you have the bias you have indicated in the behavioral answers. If they know it's going to stop, it biased the experimentation. Also, collective effects on individuals. If you, uh, just like Finland did it, it's just uh, sorting out at a national level. You can't see the effect, but you can have bias uh, through media. Uh, of course, uh, you can t starting interviewing people who are getting this uh, minimum income, so it's going to change their behavior. So there are many uh, subjects that uh, would give a limitation to this randomized uh, uh, experiment. So it shows its limits, uh, but with Oscar Duflo, he had a Nobel Prize. But lots of criticisms uh, um, uh, arise from this. From a political viewpoint, you have methodological limits too, limits, uh, financial limits, because it costs a lot of money and uh, lots of means, financial means, have to be put into these experimentations. And then also politically, it's very well recognized, uh, Nobel Prize of Economy, uh, uh, and uh, it's really the only method of uh, uh, doing, uh, carrying out these experimentations. So the political objective, beyond the fact that it was the institution of poli public policies, we had to convince of how serious and how formal the research was. So I think it's a very interesting point because it's the usage of uh, the use of science for by policymakers. And then also we could really change things and say what are the uh, what uh, does uh, science do with uh, politic too? The other way around. Oui, Joël, vas-y. Oui. Faire un peu l'avocat du diable. <laughs> euh... OK, so we are in a experimentation phase of reflection, etc. But let's say, OK, uh, a, a political uh, assumption, we can modelize and balance this kind of benefits. Aren't you afraid? It's not just a small story. Uh, it's something different to a social system. It's really a very uh, big change. The pillar of redistribution with social security, we have social aids, uh, we have all the small helps. So the risk isn't to completely uh, create a, uh, 
a uh, with the un universal side of the in of this income with a system with a neoliberalism with a specificity of rights even at social security we can see that uh, uh, some um, uh, people benefiting from this uh, benefits they have sometimes to pay part of it but there is this new uh, social uh, uh, situation of poverty before the distribution worked really well if we really think about this uh, um, revenue it's because the system is actually uh, in crisis and I can see the uh, universal revenue it's not specific anymore but if there's no specificity isn't it a dis, uh, dis uh, uh, this uh, really a, a balance the balance will not be uh, meet again because of system of distribution will be really questioned and it will be uh, highly costly uh, to give this uh, minimum uh, income universal income and then there's uh, also the uh, the um, problems with trade unions because they don't completely agree with this uh, universal income there's also the, uh, uh, the uh, increasing of uh, salaries and then the uh, there will be less pressure on these uh, salary income uh, salary increase sorry so uh, again i'm thinking it will be uh, if if it happened maybe it would be a, a problem and an issue I can do it very quickly. You're touching upon the question of uh, the corporatist uh, model. If we look at uh, Spin and Anderson on the protection, social protection models, it is uh, really supported by the integration of uh, into work with all the social security, etc. Continuing on social insurance systems that w were based on work. But there is a very strong evolution of financing that is really uh, supported on uh, taxing, but also on types of uh, allocation, because uh, it, uh, it is really at the uh, detriment of uh, uh, social insurances. So there is a, a balance. It's a du dual uh, model already. You don't need a universal uh, minimum income. We already have this dual model. But we can see that um, there are gaps in this model, the question of uh, young people, people who don't use their rights, their benefits, uh, the 1.5 for uh, couples. All these gaps, uh, all this uh, minimum income will be there to help filling the gaps and to really uh, validate the evolution which is already here. To recognize that uh, there's a dual system between uh, insurance and helping models. So we're really uh, here on the financing arbitrary. Um, uh, we have a new report that has come out on this where uh, 20 billion. We can do it. We can do all this between 15 and 20, and 20 billion. It's not that much. Uh, social security budget is 300 billion, something like that. So we need to look at this. When you look at the place of the uh, help for the whole of the uh, social uh, benefits expenses, it's very weak. So uh, this integration of young people in this and uh, the uh, uh, really uh, it would not be that uh, difficult to make a choice. So. I'm not sure it's really that easy. I'm not sure it is uh, that uh, simple. Uh, we could have a system, a government system that would integ integrate trade unions. Uh, trade unions are getting, uh, they're getting rid of uh, them. I think we should do the other way, uh, the other thing. Thing. And so trade unions should really speak about taxations and all this. So the uh, basic revenue, universal minimum income, uh, was uh, proposed in the first place but by, by social democrats. 
On the universality of this income, if we can couple together the social taxing uh, uh, integration to have a continuity of benefits, we are really in a universal revenue. It will not be given to everyone. It will depend of where you stand on your taxation system. But everyone really uh, could um, apply to it and it will be very coherent for our social system. It is really a real revolution because everything will be coherent for these benefits uh, policy. Uh, logics are, can be in tension, but they can be complementary too. I will not be as knowledgeable as uh, Timothy. You were saying that you are the devil's advocate, but uh, the political will of uh, President Méric, who is uh, president of the re of the uh, department, the county council of Haute Garonne, he, uh, he was saying we should do something. We can't accept that in this France, who is uh, fifth or sixth in a uh, world ranking for uh, wealth, uh, we just can't look at uh, these young people uh, waiting uh, to uh, be fed in their uh, in their coming to a, a food association, and that uh, we can't accept this. And uh, we must, says Georges Méric, we must do something. This debate should be at the heart of the political game. The period maybe is the best one now because we're going to have, a, uh, he said to me, uh, we're going to have elections and we should really put at the heart of the political game to help uh, young people from 18 to 24. Four, there are two countries in Europe who, uh, which don't help their uh, young people from 18 to 24 financially. It's Liechtenstein in France. I'm not very happy with this. Our country isn't there to help uh, young people. So left policy, as we mean it, will uh, try to... Uh, will. Uh, change the uh, perception of um, the poorest of us. Uh, I think the oxymoron is very good. He, say, he says it's the regulatory utop utopia, and I find it very good. It's an uh, excellent utopia, regulatory utopia. On this question, I think the duality between the insurance and the assistance is really based on assumptions to work relationships that can evolve. The uh, relationships to work uh, for people is not the same as it was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And we could think that without demonetizing the uh, uh, value of uh, work, it is very important cohesion and society, this uh, relationship to work is evolving and uh, you come out of this duality and you can start thinking things differently. We spoke about it with the IE, uh, AI, sorry, artificial intelligence. And of course, uh, it is a very uh, uh, in the future, but of course it could destroy many, many employments and you should have a, a social protection that will be founded only, not just on, uh, on, on tax. So it is very important. Also, uh, ecological transition is a, a main uncertainty for the model that uh, we are uh, uh, placing the uh, pro social progress in uh, growth and employment, uh, etc. So those reflections are really important. I just want to come back to the fact that uh, to show that things are different, Mr. Adaman, uh, Hardeman Sword told us about uh, the well-being or welfare indicators in uh, uh, the Netherlands, and he showed us the uh, different dimensions that those indicators want to take into account. And listening to you, 
I could see that uh, reference points can change through uh, parallel uh, progresses for connecting uh, topics. When you look at new uh, indicators of well-being, you can see and you can show that the employment and work is one of the dimensions amongst many other dimensions of well-being perceived by the actors. Um, shared, uh, showed us an indicator that measured the functionalities, the way uh, where individuals will weight their different criteria, safety at work, revenue, income, uh, subjective uh, well-being, uh, personal development. Uh, you talked about uh, also the uh, problem with uh, having a housing and having access to your f to be a first time buyer and you're not going to start uh, working if you need to move houses and you can't find housing it's a negative it has a negative impact also difficulties to uh, find uh, um, housing uh, quality of life societal uh, involvement social relations uh, relationships all these uh, are uh, dimensions that can interact with this reflection on minimum income because it can have positive uh, um, really input in in all these situations which is not the case uh, for uh, certain benefits or uh, income from work so uh, those two things uh, thinkings are intertwined Uh, oui, bonjour. J'aurais eu une question, donc c'était par rapport à, à l'expérimentation. Yes, talking about this uh, experimentation. Yes, we can hear you, says the interpreting booth. A question uh, towards uh, the, uh, regarding the experimentation. Some people got this minimum income, maybe with the behavior uh, with the offer, how could we react in this, uh, if we had a generalization of this uh, minimum income, there'd be an increase of uh, maybe uh, uh, price of uh, rentings uh, or inflation. I don't know. Did you uh, deal with this uh, element in your experimentation? Thank you. We should test it really to measure this. We should uh, we should really generalize it. That will uh, let us know uh, how it would impact uh, inflation and uh, rentings. Uh, for RSA, uh, it's people who don't have much credit, so anyway, it doesn't really have a major incidence in, at the time that we didn't have any inflation. It wasn't the same economic context. Let's say that. And here we need a very high purchasing power. Things have changed. Where we dealt with the APL, APL being the family benefits, and they are um, often uh, given directly. Uh, it's um, benefits for renting, and uh, they are often given directly to the uh, tenants. Um, so uh, they were not uh, tempted to increase their uh, tenancy uh, prices because they knew that a person you are uh, housing uh, gets uh, they get this housing benefit so um, there was a, a whole uh, report on this on uh, the reform of the uh, help APL in French housing benefits it was a reflection concentrated on this uh, um, housing benefit question it is a limited answer, but that gives you some elements. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or reactions on housing benefits? Uh, I'm very sceptical when they say housing benefits uh, increase price of rentings. Tenants, they look at uh, how many people are waiting for 
to get uh, they uh, if they if they have lots of uh, people uh, actually wanting to uh, let their uh, house or their flat, they're going to increase the. Uh, the uh, pr uh, the price of the tenancy. Uh, economic science is sometimes uh, used uh, uh, in a wrong way. It is uh, the, the uh, uh, points are really uh, um, sometimes uh, misused, and uh, the reasoning can be just very rigorous. And it's a question of offer and demand, just as simple as that. And whether you are left or right, if you have a uh, common sense and good faith, uh, it's very easy to uh, say things. I have a question about the experimentation, the way it was envisaged on the impact valuation assessment. Uh, so we thought about uh, the fact that uh, if variables are multiplied to explain uh, the variations of treatment to be uh, really to speak with an experiment, it is a very complex indeed, so you have only used one dosage of the medicine, uh, if I may say so. But then also the variables, the impact, uh, what, what are we measuring here? Again, the question of uh, the referential references is very important to choose the variable, a return, uh, going back to work, well-being, and how do you measure it? Can you tell us a bit more about this? That gave, uh, gave rise to many discussions with the scientific uh, world because uh, they said it should be very simple to assess things in a very precise uh, and valuable manner. The RSA in uh, 2009, and you can see that with this report, it was very difficult to isolate on the uh, right territory the uh, re real impact of the uh, RSA. Oh. How, uh, other impacts. I don't have an answer on this. People came with many issues, uh, accumulated issues, and this assessment was really focused on uh, life's uh, dimensions. And the scientific wanted a qualitative and quantitative mix with this cohort effect beyond the 18 months of uh, allocating the benefit. And then this test group and control group that uh, would allow us to measure the gaps. But we were very aware of the fact that we couldn't isolate the impact of the benefit that will impact also the amount of the benefit. If the amount is not uh, high enough, it's just uh, not a good assessment then. It makes uh, things uh, more complicated. It is an issue, indeed, because uh, this uh, uh, experimentation assessment, this relationship is not easy. Each experimentation has to be assessed, and they are uh, uh, sustained by values and orientations. So if we always go back to going back to work, what are the objectives of this experiment behind the uh, assessment of impact? I can see, I remember this. We uh, use three um, assessment uh, criteria, going back to work in financial aspects, because we thought that according to uh, people's behavior for the young, they could choose between are they going to stay in at home and then they will not have the minimum income or they will come out and then they will have the minimum uh, income. So there is a behavior, a choice by the indi individual. So the uh, financial aspect uh, was impacted by the behavioral uh, questions. That was the first point, the uh, evolution uh, of uh, the uh, poverty rate in the territories and the uh, uh, indicators of uh, social well-being. And uh, it was um, not very clear. We had introduced this as a first uh, main objective. Then we had to look at uh, whether it was health or this type of uh, criteria, psychological aspects to uh, the subjective well-being. Uh, 
Second point, the question of uh, social and professional insertion. The idea here being that uh, uh, these uh, people had to be re-socialized. It was going back to work and being socialized again. And then the third level, financial aspects, because it was really a main issue. So, the three, uh, that was the three uh, pillars. And then on, on details, we didn't work on it. We had first uh, reflections on how we should implement this. There was the idea to use administrative databases, classical way, it costs nothing. And then the idea to uh, carry out uh, complementary inquests. Uh, and then it was more difficult. Who could do it? Who should do it? And how much would it cost? And then the idea of who pays for it. Because experimentation, randomized experimentations are expensive. If you just administrative data, it's okay. If you carry out uh, inquests, then it's uh, more difficult and more costly. So there was uh, experimentation funds just for territory zero uh, non uh, non employment. So there is this fund that was uh, financed by recycling uh, costs that will uh, actually finance this minimum income. So it wasn't down to the council to pay it. And then the council will pay for the assessment. It is not as costly. It was. Uh, it can be supported. And then it he, he wouldn't be instrumentalized uh, politically. And we could uh, really get into objectives. And it was just, uh, not just uh, focusing on uh, going back to work. So we had uh, institutional challenges here. Thank you very much. Would you like to have a few words, uh, concluding remarks, maybe, Timothy, on the uh, future of this uh, universal minimal income? Do you think there is a serial, s serious perspe perspective? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Arnaud Simeon adds a few words saying that we're ready. Uh, we have many uncertainties ahead of us, but with our humility, and uh, we need to really implement it to see what are the gaps and uh, what can we do. Yes, or maybe you can say this, it's, it's no use. But if we say our people are much better, they are being helped financially, helping somebody. It's not a huge budget. It's an investment uh, helping uh, young people. Uh, Frank strategy and Luz Fraser, uh, Frank strategy is not uh, really left. They were saying in 2020 that you needed to create a minimum income for the young people. So we are really here in the starting blocks. We're ready for it. Yes, and also we are doing many things in a, uh, t territorial collectivities, administration. It's a great lab for research, experimentation. It's, it goes well beyond this uh, universal minimal income. Uh, really beyond this, we it's really a real fight against poverty and uh, precarious situations and uh, having a scientific approach is a great, great tool for us. Thank you. Uh, an element on the, of the, on the, for the future, speaking about uh, the past, RMI was voted in 1988 in a, a National Assembly that uh, looked like this one. There is no dissolution, by the way, and they say they couldn't, there was no governance possible. But uh, the um, actually negotiations started in the 60s. We had Besançon, Rennes, and many local experimentations that were carried out. It lasted for more than 20 years. So let's uh, meet again in 2040 to make it short. Thank you very much and give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for those two days of uh, work, of uh, de debate, uh, um, have, uh, they have come to an end. We're very uh, happy to launch again the cycle of activity of the chair. 
because collectivities gave us uh, some financing for three more years. We're delighted about it. We will organize other events. Here the period isn't very uh, favorable. Our students aren't here. Uh, there are um, have many uh, other uh, co competing uh, events uh, in Toulouse. We try to do it at different times so that we have more people here. Uh, we could welcome more people uh, during the debates. Uh, it was extremely stimulating. And I'll give the floor to Ron Boschma, who is the head at, uh, at academic, uh, uh, really uh, head of the chair, and you'll say a few words to us. So thank you to uh, the Sciences Po Toulouse teams who have helped organizing this event. Anne-Marie, Philippe, Sophie, they're not here, but they helped us tremendously so that things could go smoothly. Thank you very much to the, uh, uh, to the administration and directorship too. Thank you. Last words for you. Indeed, I, I enjoyed it tremendously the uh, last uh, two days. Uh, I all also enjoyed very much uh, your interventions uh, uh, today uh, in, this, uh, in this panel discussion. I learned a lot about France and about basic income. Uh, so I think it's a very good and interesting initiative, right? Uh, we, of course, raised many questions uh, as we discussed. Uh, so it's, I think that was very good. We had many more of these very interesting meetings in the last couple of days. So uh, I'm very thankful and very grateful for all uh, being here and having attended uh, our meetings, uh, participating in the, in the discussions uh, uh, yesterday and today. Again, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I enjoyed Toulouse. Uh, it's a great city to be. Uh, uh, and, uh, um, well, I hope to see you all uh, uh, in the upcoming events, right? Uh, as uh, Olivier already said, uh, there will be, uh, uh, there's funding made available uh, for the next three years. So we will organize many more events uh, coming up. Uh, uh, we had already some uh, very interesting events in the last Three years, I mean, it's all mentioned here, right? We had excellent speakers, very distinguished speeches from abroad, uh, Nobel Prize winners and maybe future Nobel Prize winners uh, uh, were among them. Uh, so uh, uh, so we, will, we will, of course, continue to organize these events. We will uh, uh, keep you updated about, uh, about uh, what, what will happen in the next coming years. Of course, I thank uh, the organization, right? So uh, many people already uh, working behind the scenes, right? Uh, 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 so the technical support, support staff uh, who did an excellent job, uh, which uh, was already uh, uh, fantastic. Although, yes. Uh, all the admin staff that, of course, made possible uh, uh, the, all the travels and, uh, and organi organis uh, organizing our uh, our. Uh, meeting venue, etc. So uh, a, a big thanks to them as well. And uh, of course, the, the, let's say, kind of scientific organization committee, right? So uh, that have been involved in, uh, in inviting the people. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, thanks a lot. Very grateful for all. And of course, all our participants that were very, uh, uh, were so kind to share their ideas, to, to share their insights uh, with us uh, uh, today and yesterday. So thanks a lot again, and I hope to see you uh, next time in the next uh, event uh, uh, in the Bernard Maris uh, uh, yeah, adventure. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. Merci à toutes et à tous.